Everybody. All right, guys. Um, are we on? Yep, yep, yep. I'm trusting that everybody had a slice of pizza. Um, if you didn't, um, I don't know, too bad. But um, there's a lot of pizza out there still. So if you haven't had a slice of pizza, um, all right. So what I'm gonna do real quick in about, uh, I'm gonna take a, maybe two minutes to do this. So uh, as I said earlier, I'm giving away these two gift bags that has a whole bunch of stuff in there. And um, it's for the members, one, and for new members. So for, I had about 60, where's some here? Well, 60, 62 um, entrants for members. Um, unfortunately, we're only able to choose one, all right? And that person is, can I get a drum roll, please? Sounds a lot better with that. Yeah. Molly Cargill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought the question she asked was, do I have to come up? Well, yeah, kind of. So, Molly, there's uh, some stuff here on the app of MIPS. Thank you. All right, there we go. Thank you so much. And, um, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people signed up, which was kind of cool. And we were able to choose one winner. And the winner is, can I get another drum roll, please? Um, where's the name again? Not the name right Oh, here it is. I'm sure we didn't cook this up. And the person is Emily Robertson. Now, let me say this. Emily was the last person to sign up just before lunch. So it was really just by chance. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your time. I will see you at some time at the ward or at some other event. All right, have a good day. Hello? I don't know how close I have to go to talk. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, especially at the back? Great. Okay, so um, I'm covering cardio today, um, which is an important topic, um, one of the three big ones, I guess, for your exams, but it's also it's really important just in real life, and a lot of the stuff I'm covering will be relevant next year as well. There's a lot of overlap with GP. Um, there's a lot of like physiology and stuff in cardio, um, and it's all really complex. So I'm going to be kind of dumbing it down to a medical student level, um, which is how I remember things. And it helps, you know, to remember things because you don't need to be a cardiologist. You just need to be a third year. Um, all right. So to begin with, I think the most important thing, I'll just go over this really quickly um, in cardiology is atherosclerosis because basically everything else 
in cardiology comes from this main problem, which basically atherosclerosis just means you know thickening of the vessels. Um, so this is more kind of relevant to your pathology exam, but I'm not going to cover a lot of pathology. That's your job. Um, but the rest of the matrix I'm going to cover. Um, so basically, with atherosclerosis, you know, you get damage to the vessel wall, um, and then things go inside your vessel wall, and then it kind of becomes inflamed, and that causes all the other cardio problems. Um, but the main important part is the risk factors for things that cause atherosclerosis are the risk factors for everything else pretty much in cardiology. So you can break them down into the non-modifiable and the modifiable risk factors. Um, so non-modifiable things include like age, um, being male or being a postmenopausal female, um, and just like a family history of cardiac disease. Um, and then in terms of modifiable, um, you kind of just have to remember SNAP, which is, you know, smoking, nutrition, so diet, alcohol, um, physical exercise and weight. Um, and so all those things together form the metabolic syndrome, um, which is diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol and, you know, problems with your lipids. Um, and this is important because if you see like any of these things, in a question, um, like they, they're pointing towards a cardiac cause. Um, and also like in an OSCE, they could ask you like, what risk factors does he have for this condition? And you can just list these off um, very easily. Um, so I won't really go over this. You can look at this in your own time. Um, but basically, I think um, this is basically how, you know, you get this buildup of atherosclerosis. But I think the most important things is that, um, one, that the, it, the buildup occurs inside the intima. So there's three layers to a blood vessel. There's the intima, the media, and the adventitia. Um, and obviously, intima is the most innermost because it's the most intimate one. And so it happens inside the intima, not between two layers. It happens inside that layer. And then the other thing to remember that comes up in questions is that um, the, you know, the, the little atherosclerosis here, it has a cap on it. And it doesn't matter, you know, the size of the atherosclerosis doesn't change how likely it is to rupture. It's how thin the cap is. So a question will ask, like, you know, what's more likely to rupture, a big plaque or a plaque with a thin cap? And it's a thin cap. Um, and so the complications that atherosclerosis causes, um, so it causes calcification of your vessels. It can lead to thrombus and emboli if you have thin caps, and it can make your vessels weak. And so that actually affects pretty much every part of your body um, so in terms of the heart, if you have stenosis of your vessels, that's when you get angina. Um, that's what angina is. Um, we'll go through that in a second. Um, and then in your brain, that's a TIA, so a mini stroke. It's kind of like angina of the brain. And then in terms of your peripheral vessels, um, you can get claudication. So that's what intermittent claudication is. It's angina of your legs. And you can get gut angina as well, um, which sometimes comes up in questions, where they have pain in their gut but there's no physical exam findings, and that's because they have stenosis or an embolus. Um, so yeah, the next thing is that you can get emboli. So if you have a big thrombus covering a vessel or an emboli, you get a heart attack or acute coronary syndrome. Um, but in your brain, that causes a full-blown stroke, and in your vessels, you can get acute limb ischemia or ischemic gut. And then finally, you can get weak vessels, which basically would cause like you know aneurysms and dissections. Um, great. So one of the topics on your matrix is hypertension. You cover this a lot more in fourth year, but I'll go through it quickly. Um, so what are the, can someone shout out what the symptoms of hypertension are? Yeah, great. There are no symptoms. And if anyone says, oh, I have a headache or whatever from hypertension, there are no symptoms to high blood pressure, with one small exception, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so there are actually four types of hypertension. So there's essential hypertension, which is basically no cause to it. So it's when you have all the risk factors I talked about earlier. Then there's um, secondary hypertension. So you know you, you need to think secondary hypertension if it's someone who's less than 40 years old or has a poor response to management. Um, and that's that can come up in a question because then if you see someone less than 40 year old and poor response, then you're thinking um, a cause like renal artery stenosis is usually the answer. Um, then there's um, the other one, important one for you guys, is malignant hypertension. So if someone has greater than 200 and 120, then that's when you start getting symptoms. That's the only time you get symptoms. Lower than that, 
you don't get symptoms unless you get complications like heart disease. Um, so causes of secondary hypertension is renal artery stenosis is the big kind of buzzword cause. Otherwise, like any um, like endocrine disease, like Cushing's, Cons, whatever, can cause it as well. Um, and also in a young person, like our age, coarctation of the aorta um, can come up, but usually they'll give you some extra sign about that. And in terms of malignant hypertension, um, the kind of signs that we can expect, um, that's when you start getting um, like ischemic stroke. So you get like an aneurysm in your brain. Um, you can get injury to your kidneys because it's all the small vessels basically that are at risk. So kidneys have small vessels, your eyes have small vessels, and your nose have small vessels and your brain. So those can all be affected. Um, not sure um, how important this is for third year. I don't know how much you guys know about hypertension, but um, so normal is 120 on 80 or less. And then above that is high normal. But once you get above 140 or 90, that's the first grade. Um, and you just add 20 and 10 each time. So then there's grade two is at 160 on 100, grade three is 180, 110, and then there's malignant. Um, I think the most important thing is that once you reach 160 on 100 and above, you start medication immediately. Whereas if you're below that, you can choose lifestyle management as an option. Um, so as an answer to a question, for example. Um, and in terms of diagnosing it, you can't diagnose hypertension in one visit. Um, you need to have two measurements in clinic. So if they've had one and it's high, the, the next thing to do is retest in 10 minutes. And they have to have one home kind of um, thing, one measurement, which is the gold standard is 24 hour blood pressure monitor. Um, and you know, just need to make sure that you're using the right cuff, that they haven't drunk any coffees and they're in like a calm position. So you want to rule out any white coat hypertension. Um, so in terms of management, um, so basically lifestyle factors, so snap and weight loss. Um, and the other extra thing is a low salt diet is like an extra thing you can add into an OSCE, um, which is a mark there. In terms of medications, what you guys need to know is that the medication to treat high blood pressure is an ACE. Um, if they've had a cough with the ACE, then you give them an ARB. That's basically the first line management that you need to know. If it says that they've used an ACE but it's not working, second line management is a calcium channel blocker. Um, and with the calcium channel blockers, there's two types, as you may know. There's the peripheral ones and the central ones. With high blood pressure, you want to do a peripheral one because the peripheral ones open up your peripheral vessels. Um, and so that's something like a lot of pain. Whereas your central ones are more for um, angina, which we'll go into soon, um, which are like verapamil. In terms of the complications of hypertension, um, so hopefully you know the complications of diabetes because they're pretty much exactly the same. Um, so macrovascular heart disease, um, brain disease, gut ischemia, and you also can get, you know, dissections, aneurysms, and then in terms of microvascular, same as diabetes, but hypertension doesn't really affect the nerves as much. Um, not too sure why, they have different mechanisms there. Um, all right, so the biggest topic, um, the most important one is ischemic heart disease. So that's basically when your heart muscle just isn't getting enough oxygen. Um, so does anyone know, can someone shout out what the primary cause is? Atherosclerosis, great. Um, that's like 90% 90, 90 or 95% of the causes. Um, the other small cause is that you can get some other something called variant angina where your vessels just spasm, but that's not important for you guys. So in terms of the coronary circulation, it's kind of good to know, you know, where your lateral, anterior, inferior, and posterior are supplied. Um, so I, I'm a visual learner, but so either you wrote learn it or you just think of the heart. So you've got the um, the right coronary artery. Um, well, let's start with the left. So you've got the left coronary artery and it splits and you've got the circumflex, which goes more laterally. So that um, supplies the lateral side. And then you've got the LAD, the left anterior descending. It's got anterior in the name, so it's easy. And then you've got inferior, which will be your right coronary artery because it kind of goes down like that. Um, and then finally, posterior is your posterior descending artery. Um, and you know, that can either be supplied by your left side or your right side, either by the right coronary artery or your um, circumflex artery. All right, so the thing to know about like angina and ischemic heart disease, it, it's all one spectrum of disease as it gets worse, as your atherosclerosis gets worse and worse and eventually 
compresses the vessel completely. So to start off with, we have stable angina, which is just a chronic condition, and then your, you know, your vessels aren't you know, that blocked. And then the next category is acute coronary syndrome. So that's when things are starting to get worse and you need acute management. And so the first type, you know, the second worst thing you can have is unstable angina. And then from there, if it's worse than unstable angina, that's called uh, acute myocardial infarction. And then there's two types. Um, there's a non-STEMI and a STEMI, which we'll go to how to differentiate between them in a second. So in terms of stable angina, um, so you can go through the WWQQ of it. So when it happens, it's a chronic condition and it happens um, during exercise. Where does any, can anyone describe the pain you feel in ischemic heart disease? Yeah, central crushing um, chest pain, um, sometimes more left-sided, and it radiates to your left shoulder, your neck, and your arm. Sometimes the question will only say neck and arm pain. That's still counted as um, a kind of angina pain. Um, and there is one exception to when you feel like very typical symptoms, and that's when you have diabetes. They're known to have a typical angina, and so they get just more kind of breathless and maybe a bit of jaw pain. It's not as clear. Um, so yeah, so it's a crushing, this tightness, a discomfort, something like that. And in terms of alleviating, for it to be called stable angina and not unstable angina, you have to, it has to be alleviated by rest for 10 to 15 minutes, longer than that, and then, you know, if it's half an hour, it's unstable angina. Or if you use a GTN spray, a nitrate spray, it should be relieved in five minutes, otherwise it's unstable angina. And in terms of things to aggravate it, there's the three E's. So there's emotion, exertion, and eating, but usually it's exertion or exercise. And in terms of history, um, past history, you'd wanna know their risk factors as well as if they have diabetes especially. Um, and also, you also kind of wanna look for precipitating factors. So people may have a background of stable angina, but if they have anemia or heart failure, that can make the pain worse or it can make the pain come up. So in terms of unstable angina, um, the differences are, the key differences is that either it's a new onset angina, so if this person has never had angina before, that's automatically classified as unstable angina. If it's at rest, that's unstable angina. And if there's a change in the pattern that they usually get it, so they get, you know, after walking 200 meters, and then suddenly they start getting it after 50 meters, then that's unstable angina. And then in terms of alleviating, it takes longer, so it takes longer than 15 minutes of rest or longer than 15 minutes of, or after using a spray. And then finally, we have an AMI. So an AMI will just have a sudden onset, usually. Um, and in terms of alleviating, nothing will alleviate, like the GTN spray won't work. Um, and then they have a whole bunch of associated symptoms. So they start getting nausea, vomiting, sweating, palpitations, they collapse, stuff like that. Like, it's usually pretty obvious if they're going into, especially these ones, if they haven't collapsed yet, if they if they're like look really unwell and they're sweating, that's the AMI. Um, so just before getting into the investigations for say um, heart disease, I think for your OSCEs, it's really important to have just a list of investigations that you can throw out. So you need bedside, you need to go through in this manner. So you start with bedside um, and you should just have these kind of in your head on your right, written on your paper. So you can ECG, BSL, urine, swab, beta HCG. Obviously you don't do these for every patient, but they should just be in your arsenal of tests. Um, then in terms of blood tests, there's the really common ones that you can almost throw out all the time, FBE, UEC, CRP, LFTs, TFTs. And then you've got some other extra very common ones, especially ABG in like an emergency, coag studies, anything with the heart, it's appropriate to do a coag study, blood cultures if there's infection, and then um, electrolytes if you think there's arrhythmias going on. And then imaging, um, so you can, you know, you just have these to kind of throw out, chest x-ray, ultrasound, echo, contrast, CT, and then special tests. So that's the kind of way you should approach any um, investigation for any OSCE. But in terms of ischemic heart disease, so in the bedside, you should do a blood sugar level. But what's the most important bedside test? ECG, amazing. Never forget that in OSCE. Um, in terms of blood, so you just kind of want to do all these FE, UEC, CRP, just to get a baseline of them. Um, and also thyroid function tests can also precipitate and also electrolytes can precipitate in arrhythmia. But um, what are some really important bloods that you have to do in ischemic heart disease? Yes, so troponins, basically the most important ones, and coag studies as well. 
Um, and in terms of imaging, does anyone know an extra imaging test that you do, especially in stable angina? But... So um, stress echo um, will come later on. Yeah, okay, that's right. In chronic stable, you do stress echo and stress ECG for sure. Uh, what about in the acute setting? If they... Yeah, an angiogram. Coronary angiogram is very important after you've done all your bloods. And then in terms of special tests later on, stress, ECG, and echo, especially once they've recovered, you want to figure out their um, baseline. So in terms of differentiating them, again, in terms of investigations, so stable angina will have no ECG changes and no troponin changes. Then unstable angina can have ECG changes, not necessarily, but it won't have troponin changes. NSTEMI will have troponin changes and what may have ECG changes. So that's how you tell the difference between unstable angina and NSTEMI um, is the troponins. And I know there's a question floating around where they say troponins are pending. So the answer to that question is that it's the answer is acute coronary syndrome because it could be any of these. If you don't have ECG findings and you don't have troponins, it could be any of these if it's an acute attack. And finally, a STEMI has to have ECG changes and it has to have a troponin rise. If you don't have a troponin rise, but you have ST elevation, you're thinking something like pericarditis. Um, and in terms of um, the actual ECG changes, so stable angina, um, more for PATH, but it's a 70% occlusion of your vessel. Unstable angina is 90% occlusion around, and then STEMI is 100% occlusion. In terms of um, these two, does anyone know what ECG changes you may get, if any? Yes, so T-wave inversion is one of them, and there's another one. ST depression, yes, yeah, so you get ST depression, T-wave inversion, and they may be randomly um, around. Um, there's no such thing as contiguous leads, or like, if you just see those and nothing else, then it's an NSTEMI or, a, or, or unstable angina, depends on the troponins. And then in terms of a STEMI, what do you have to say? ST elevation, but it has to be in two contiguous leads which we'll go through later, which means basically two leads that are supplied by the same vessel. If it's ST elevation in random leads, then it's not a STEMI. The other thing is that if you see a new onset left bundle branch block, that's also counted as a STEMI. Um, so that can trick you over in an exam question. So a new left bundle branch block that's never been seen before on an ECG is a STEMI as well. So in terms of management of stable angina, it's a chronic condition. Um, so you always start with lifestyle. And lifestyle is smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Address their risk factors as well. So if they have high blood pressure, start them on medication. If they have diabetes, start them on medication. And a referral to a cardiologist who can do stress echo, stress ECG. Um, and you should always, um, in terms of investigations, you should always investigate their risk factors. So BMI, blood pressure, blood glucose, and lipids um, in any stable angina kind of OSCE. In terms of medications, I use a lot of um, acronyms for cardiology. So the one I remembered for, um, and you just kind of have to write these down a few times and then they sink in. Um, so the one I used just to trigger my memory was BANDS um, for stable angina. So B stands for beta blockers, A stands for aspirin, N stands for nitrates, and then S stands for statin. So beta blockers and aspirin are pretty much a must for most patients. Um, the beta blockers kind of just relaxes the heart and stops it from contracting too hard, so it doesn't work itself too hard. Aspirin is for anticoagulation. And then the nitrates are just PRN, so you just give them when you have an attack. And statin you only give to people with high lipids, you don't just give it to everyone, but most people will have high lipids if they have stable angina. Um, so there's a bit of a problem with beta blockers and Monash. So if you have asthma, if any question says asthma in the stem, like, you order, like they're trying to trick you with a beta blocker somewhere, usually. Um, so what do you replace a beta blocker with? Yeah, so a calcium channel blocker and a centrally acting one because we're talking about the heart here. So you want something like verapamil, a centrally acting one. So in terms of if someone comes in with a heart attack or with unstable angina, what's the first step of any acute presentation? Um, well, the first step is actually doctor's A, B, C, D, and, um, but that was, that's good, that's coming very quickly soon, um, but like always, um, 
in this is like specially OSCE kind of thing. If you have an emergency station, run through your doctor's ABCD. So say check for danger, you know, I'll send someone to call for help. I'll check the airways, give them O2 if they need it. Um, and then I'll put two large bore IV cannulas. Um, and then the D, so I added like Dr. I extended it to ABCDE. So D is for um, like disability. So things that, you know, that are causing them harm. So it's kind of extra medications to give. It's usually analgesia and antiemetics. You can throw in any station. And then E is for extra investigations. So you want to put ECG and do troponin straight away. And then we get to our management more. And then again, um, so the management is MONASH, the acronym that's been spread around for many years. Um, and so that really helps in the acute setting. Um, so you always want to give, oops, or whatever, it's already here. So you want to give morphine, um, oxygen if they have low SATs, nitrates um, helps relieve the pain, and aspirin. Um, the S stands for save life, or everyone has a different thing for S, but I like save life. Um, and then H is for heparin. Um, it depends, the, the cardiologists usually start that when you're doing the save life procedures, um, but it's something to mention, maybe the question will ask you. So in terms of the procedures that definitively manage, there's, what are the, there are three procedures you can do. Can people shout them out? So PCI is one. Yeah, thrombolysis or thrombolysis. And there's one more. Okay, <laughs> a bit sad. Um, before you go palliative, you can think of surgery. <laughs> um, depends how old they are. If they're 95 and have a do not resus, then leave them alone. Um, but otherwise, you can try a cabbage, so a cor coronary artery bypass graft. Um, and each of them have their own indications. So with a PCI, when a patient walks in the door, what's the maximum time you have to give PCI? 90 minutes, so that's really important. Um, if they're not within the 90 minutes, you can't, you know, or if they're in a rural setting and it seems like they won't be able to get PCI, which is where they just, they, you know, they cut a hole in one of your arteries and they go inside and retrieve the clot or something like that. Um, if you can't get that done in 90 minutes, so usually it'll be rural in a question, then the next step is thrombolysis, but then there's a maximum time for that as well. Does anyone know the maximum time for thrombolysis? 12 hours. 12 hours. It's, it depends, it actually does depend. Um, I think in with Monash, they usually limit it with cardiac to 4.5, with strokes to six, but it, it, in real life, it actually varies. Um, and if, but thrombolysis is very dangerous, it has a lot of contraindications in terms of if they've had a recent stroke or they've had active bleeding, you can't do it. So in that case, the last line is a cabbage. Um, or if the, the question says they have three vessel disease, so three of their arteries are blocked, you jump straight to a coronary artery bypass graft because it's you just need to do that straight away. Um, so then once you've saved someone's life who's had you know an acute event, acute coronary syndrome, then you go back to chronic. So the chronic management is very similar. Lifestyle is still SNAP, address risk factors, referral to cardiologist. In terms of medications, you it's the same, but you add two more. Um, I used SNARB C, I don't know what it means, but it, it helped me remember everything. But if you notice B, A, N, and S are still there from stable angina, and we just add another A and a C. Um, so the S, again, is a statin. The N is a nitrate when you need it. The A, the, the new golden A, special one, is um, an ACE inhibitor. Um, most of the people will have high blood pressure, and in general, ACE inhibitors help prevent any changes to your heart after an ischemic event. Um, they prevent left ventricular remodeling is the official way of saying it. The other A is aspirin, a beta blocker, and then plus minus C is clopidogrel, um, which is another, it's very similar to aspirin, so it's an antiplatelet agent. Um, and then again with beta blockers, always remember if they have asthma, it's an absolute contraindication in Monash, or they just want you to choose something else. Um, yeah, so ACE is one of the most important, pretty much the most important medication that's added on. So the complications of um, a heart attack, there's some general ones, like it basically the rest of my lecture, everything can be caused by ischemic heart disease. So arrhythmias, because you have changes in your heart, you destroy your conduction system. You get heart failure because your heart can't work as well. You get valvulopathies because some of your valve is broken off. You get aneurysms, you get emboli. 
but there are two delayed kind of complications that are important um, in questions. So does anyone know what the main complication you can get in four to 10 days post an AMI? Yes, so ventricular rupture and leading to a tamponade most likely because all the blood goes into, your, into the sac around the heart. So that's a good question they can ask if someone suddenly you know, goes into shock. And then what can you get two to 10 weeks post? Dresler syndrome, which is pericarditis, um, which we'll go into later. All right, so the next major topic is heart failure. Um, so basically, that's just when the heart literally can't, it's a pump, and it can't pump enough blood in time for your body's needs. Um, and you can have left-sided, right-sided, or combined um, heart failure, which is usually called together, it's called congestive cardiac failure. So the way to think about the signs and symptoms of heart failure is so we have the heart here and we have an input tract and an output tract. Now the heart can't beat as fast, it can't beat as hard anymore, maybe because it had a heart attack earlier or there's an arrhythmia. So it's not um, pumping as hard. So that means that the out, there's not gonna be as much output because you just physically can't pump enough out. And so that will cause symptoms. At the same time, you've got the blood that's trying to get into the heart and the heart isn't keeping up with the pace. And so you get backflow symptoms as well. Um, so that's how everything works, basically. Um, and so just a quick reminder that you have a right heart, which is the blue, um, that system, and the left heart, which is the red, so from the lungs to the body, and they give you different symptoms. Um, and so you can go through that. So in terms of the right heart, the right heart, so in terms of backflow kind of symptoms, what symptoms do you get? Yes, yeah, so raised AVP is a sign, um, but yes, you do get that. Um, so just again, with signs and symptoms, just in case it's not, so signs are things the doctor will examine, symptoms is what the patient will come in with. So they'll come in with ankle swelling, and they may come in with some bloating. And the bloating is from like ascites or leak of fluid into their gut. Ankle swellings leak of fluid into their ankles. Um, and, and, and in terms of signs, so um, you get, um, you get oops, JVP rise. Um, you also get um, ascites and you can get hepatomegaly because you've got a lot of blood that's just staying inside your liver. Um, and then the, the edema is pitting, um, which is important. In terms of your left heart, um, so in terms of um, backflow from your left heart, so blood that's coming from the lungs gets stuck, what symptoms do you get? Shortness of breath, so dyspnea, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Um, and then also the pink frothy sputum is, a, is from that backflow, so the blood, um, some of the liquid kind of leaks into your um, alveoli and you cough that up. So that's a rare kind of thing to happen in real life, but it can be a bit of a buzzword. Um, and in terms of output symptoms, so you just can't keep up with your output, um, you basically it's kind of like fatigue, because like you're not getting enough blood to your muscles, so you can't run as far, you can't do anything. Um, in terms of signs, so what do you hear? If someone's got lots of fluid in their lungs, what do you hear when you're an oscillating? Yeah, so bi-basal crackles is the, um, the main thing, and then, if it's really bad, the blood can leak out you know, to and become an effusion. But an edema, like pulmonary edema and effusion are different. Pulmonary edema is edema inside your airways, and then an effusion is, um, is, is fluid inside your, like, in, plur in the pleural sac. Um, that's only if it's really bad, so you can get a dullness. Um, and then in terms of signs of output, so um, the heart has to work harder. So this heart, it's often have a displaced apex beat. You often have an S3 gallop rhythm, um, which basically is an extra heart sound. Um, and it's kind of, the way I think about it, it's not entirely correct, it's like it's working extra hard. So you're like galloping along, I don't know. Um, but if you see S3 gallop murmur, that's usually just a sign that it's heart failure going on. Um, no specific valve necessarily. Um, so in terms of the etiology of heart failure, so we've got causes and then we've got precipitants. So I kind of meant to ask this, but the four most common causes are things that cause 
structural, the structural damage to the heart. So if you have ischemic heart disease, your heart muscle won't work as well. If you have valvular defects, they won't work as well. If you have high blood pressure, that actually changes the shape of your heart and it's really hard for the heart to pump. And then there's cardiomyopathies, um, which are intrinsic diseases of the heart muscle, which I will cover in a second. And then there's precipitants, so, which basically means people will have these things in the background, but they won't have heart failure. They won't have any of the signs and symptoms we said until one of these things happens. So IIAA is how I remembered it, but basically infection, um, ischemia, anemia or an arrhythmia are the main kind of things that would cause you to have acute, you know, breathlessness. And then um, medications, always think of medications and diet um, as well. But these are the important ones. So just quickly on cardiomyopathies. So cardiomyopathies are just diseases of the heart muscle itself, and they're usually kind of genetic, but they can be acquired. There are three you need to know really briefly. There's dilated, restrictive, and hypertrophic obstructive. So dilated, does anyone know the cause of dilated cardiomyopathy? Yes, big association with alcohol. There's also, I don't know if you've heard of broken heart syndrome, where you have an in, in, in intense stress, and then you can actually get dilated cardiomyopathy temporarily. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, does anyone know the cause of that? So that's radiation therapy generally. So if someone's had breast cancer and they had radiation therapy, now they have heart failure, they have a restrictive cardiomyopathy. And with restrictive cardiomyopathy, you get Kuzmol's sign, which is basically your JVP rises on inspiration. Um, and Kuzmol's sign is a sign of restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. It's not a sign of tamponade, um, which has often been said in the past, it's not a sign of cardiac tamponade. Um, and then, Hypertrophic obstructive um, is basically when you have an adolescent that collapses and there's a family history of sudden death, that's what's leading you towards hypertrophic obstructive and that's when they just, the lumen of their heart is really small because they have so much muscle. So in terms of investigations um, for heart failure, so always an ECG in any heart station. In terms of bloods, does anyone know any specifically important bloods for a heart failure presentation? BMP, great. Um, Obviously, it depends how they're presenting. You want to do troponins, and there's something called a cardiomyopathy screen, which you don't need to know what's in it, but you can throw it out. Um, but a BMP is very sensitive. So if they've got shortness of breath and you're not sure why, you can do a BMP test, and that will tell you, you know, it's, it's, if it's likely if it's heart failure, um, or rule out heart failure really easily. That's what I meant. That's what a sensitive test does. Um, in terms of imaging, um, echo is the most important thing in any heart failure case, because you want to find the cause. And then special tests is a stress echo. Um, so another thing, obviously, you do when someone's short of breath, you do a chest x-ray. And there are signs that you see on an x-ray in acute heart failure, when you've got fluid in your lungs. Um, so the way to remember, the way I remember this is with another mnemonic, just A, B, C, D, E. Um, and like if you get in an OSCE, it's clearly heart failure. If these signs are kind of hard to see, but you can just spurt them out and say that they're on the x-ray because they are. Um, so A is for alveolar bat winging. And so that's kind of like the shadowiness on the sides here, which is meant to look like a bat wing. Um, B is for curly B lines, which you'll never be able to see. They're just small lines, like it's not that important. Um, C is cardiomegaly. So your heart has increased size because it's dilated or it's hypertrophy. Um, and then E is for, or D is for dilated upper vessels, just have to know that. And then E is for effusion, so when it gets really bad, you can get blunting of your costophrenic angle. Um, and then this is a small little picture of what kind of describes what each thing is, so that's bat winging. And then you can sometimes see the vessels in the upper lobes, sometimes see curly B lines. Cardiomegaly you'll always see, and plural effusion you'll mostly see. In terms of the acute management, um, Another um, acute management, always doctors A, B, C, D, pretty much exactly the same thing. So you can always spat that out. And then there's like the next step, which is like actually trying to manage it. So um, another alphabetical thing. So LMNOP um, works a charm to remember this. So L, what does it, oh, it's a bit hard to ask that. Okay. L stands for Lasix. So that's like kind of the most important thing and usually the answering questions. If someone has acute shortness of breath, um, you give them fruzamide, which is Lasix. Um, M is for morphine. N um, is for nitrates. Again, they'll often have concurrent chest pain. O is for oxygen. 
um, because they're they're breathless usually and their sats will be low. Does anyone know how we give the oxygen? CPAP, because we're trying to keep their um, airways open. The airways are kind of blocked with fluid, and so we're trying to you know bust them open. Um, and then P is position, which is always a good thing to remember in an OSCE. It makes you look good that you want them to stay completely upright, not lying down, because you want you know because otherwise the fluid just kind of sits there. Um, and so that should resolve an acute episode. Um, in terms of chronic management, so after they've recovered from an acute breathless episode. Um, Lifestyle things, as always, all the same cardio things. The extra thing is that you should give them, um, you should offer them the flu vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine, because if you have fluid in your lungs, you're more likely to get chest infections. Um, in terms of medications, um, it's blades. So basically, for heart failure and um, ischemic heart disease, I just use the four mnemonics. I went through, and that kind of gets you through all the questions. So blades, so B is for beta blockers. Again, remember if they have asthma. L is for Lasix, but only if they're symptomatic, only when they have acute heart failure, they can give their own Lasix. A is for an ACE inhibitor, and that's actually the first line medication. So that's what you should give first if they ask, what you should give first. Um, D is for the Joxin, but it's a plus minus. Does anyone know when we give the Joxin? If they have atrial fibrillation as well, only if they have AF, otherwise it doesn't really help. Um, e is for extra, not very helpful. Um, so that's things you just to prompt you to remember that people with heart failure, they're fluid overloaded. So you want to give a strict fluid and salt balance. And then S is spironolactone. And that's kind of the last line. So once you've tried beta blockers, ACE inhibitor, then you go to spironolactone um, or digoxin if they have AF. And that helps with all your symptoms. Um, does that all make sense so far? Any questions from anyone? So yes, that's a good, um, so spironolactone um, and ACE also has a mortality benefit. Um, beta blockers also, but Lasix, Digoxin and, yeah, Lasix and Digoxin don't have a mortality. They're just symptomatic more. So Lasix is not like a chronic medication. Lasix is just when they develop acute shortness of breath, then they should give themselves Lasix and then stop it once they feel better. Um, but spironolactone will become a chronic medication. So you start with ACE and then you add it. Usually they're discharged on ACE and a beta blocker. And then if that's not working, you add a spironolactone. So the third line. Third line, yeah. Um, Okay, so valvular disease, um, which is basically all the murmurs, is something that really um, confused me when I was learning about it. Um, but we'll go through it quickly. So just remember where you hear, you know, it's good just to remember where all the valves are. Um, so just, I just put that up there. Um, that's your job to remember that. Um, so in terms of valvular disease, the signs and symptoms um, Oh, quickly before, so just want to confirm with everyone. Um, so in terms of your first and second heart sound, um, so your first heart sound is in systole, and systole is when you're squeezing your ventricles, and that's um, these two, the atrioventricular valves closing, so your um, tricuspid and your mitral valve. And then diastole is the second heart sound, and that's your aortic and pulmonary valve, the semilunar valves closing. So I was always confused how you remember which murmur is for which valve problem, um, but there's a way you can work through it in your head. So if we first think of systole, so your ventricles are, com are contracting and you're pushing all your blood through the um, aortic and pulmonary valves. So if those valves are stenosed, if the blood's not allowed to go through them, then you get a, um, a murmur. So in aortic stenosis, it's systolic murmur because it's when the ventricles are contracting. And in pulmonary stenosis, it's also systolic because the ventricles are contracting, pushing blood through a valve that doesn't want to let blood through. On the flip side, if you're pushing your ventricles and you want all your blood to go through here, but then it goes through either through there or it goes through there. So the two valves on the sides, the AB valves, are leaky. So they have regurgitation. That's when you get another systolic murmur. So Tricuspid regurgitation is pan-systolic because 
it's you know because it's not it's leaking blood during systole. It's it's meant to be closed, but then it's letting blood through because the ventricles are too strong. Same thing with mitral regurge. It's also pansystolic. So if you think through ahead, if you think of the heart contracting, you can figure out all these four murmurs. And on the flip side, you can figure out the things happening in diastole. So it's the exact opposite. So blood's meant to come through here, but if the valves are stenosed then you get tricuspid stenosis, which is diastolic, and mitral stenosis, which is mid-late diastolic as well. Um, and then if it's through, if blood is coming through here in diastole, um, so it's regurgitating, you get a murmur, a diastolic murmur. So aortic regurgitation is a diastolic murmur, and pulmonary regurgitation, which isn't as important, is also a diastolic murmur. So that's how you work through the different murmurs. And then from there, extra information is basically where you listen to it and some other little buzzwords. But you can pretty much, without any buzzwords, you can figure out any murmur question. Um, so in terms of aortic stenosis, does anyone know the murmur? Yeah, ejection systolic murmur, and it radiates to your carotids. Um, what kind of symptoms do you get with aortic stenosis? Yeah, you get sad backwards. Um, so dyspnea, angina, syncope. Oops, yeah. Um, you do get sad backwards, I wrote it forwards. Um, and so there's something called aortic sclerosis, um, and I was confused what the difference between them is. So aortic sclerosis is just when your valve is thick, that's what sclerosis means. Um, and the difference is that there's no symptoms with aortic sclerosis, whereas aortic sclerosis is pathological and it will cause symptoms. I've heard something about aortic sclerosis not radiating to the carotids, I can't, I can't confirm that, but maybe. But it's the fact that if there's no symptoms, it's aortic sclerosis. And if it's an older person, no symptoms, 100% sclerosis, not stenosis. In terms of regurgitation, so what's the murmur? Early, Early diastolic. Um, and you also get a displaced apex because if you think about it, all the blood from the aorta is coming back into your heart and it's you know pushing your apex and that's why you get a displaced apex. Um, what kind of signs? Do people know the signs you get with aortic regurgitation? Yeah, so head bombing is one of them. Um, there's a few like eponymous ones. The main one is um, a collapsing pulse um, or a water hammer pulse. So if you think about it, um, you know, you feel the pulse in systole and then in diastole, all the blood from your like systemic circulation is going back through the aorta, back into your heart. So it kind of collapses really quickly. Um, and what's the main cause of aortic regurgitation? So idiopathic, but also if you have aortic dissection, but also if you have aortic dissection, then if they've had it in the past and now they have a murmur, likely to be regurgitation. Um, so then there's Hockham, which is in the valvular disease, but it causes murmurs. Um, so you hear an ejection systolic, and the kind of buzzword is it's louder on Valsalva. Um, and it'll usually be a young person, and the symptoms is sudden death, or um, they have a jerky pulse, because the heart's like really, I don't know, muscular, and it's, I don't know, it's jerky, I, it just, it is. Um, in terms of mitral regurgitation, so that's a pan-systolic murmur, because during systole it's not working properly and the blood's going through. Um, other kind of things with it is that it radiates to the axilla, and it's high-pitched, um, as well, because the mitral valve comes from the bishop's hat, the mitre, and bishops are high pitched in their voice. I don't know. Um, the main cause is kind of, can be idiopathic, can be uh, skimming heart disease, but the like other association is mitral valve prolapse. If you have a mitral valve prolapse, you also have one more finding, which is a mid systolic click, which is your mitral valve kind of hitting the heart and causing the click. So, um, so one, a question may ask, you know, what the cause of this murmur is. And if you hear a click, it's prolapse. If you don't hear a click, then it's just plain regurgitation. In terms of stenosis, so that's the diastolic murmur again. And the other kind of association is a tapping apex beat. Um, and the signs you get, you get, a, you get mitral facies, which makes sense because it's mitral stenosis. Um, and you get a bifid P wave. So the P wave looks like an M on your ECG. Um, and the main cause is rheumatic fever in the past. Um, so that's a big, very strong association. Um, and then tricuspid regurgitation, so that's again pansystolic. And then the kind of associations with that is that you get a elevated JVP, 
with giant V waves, and you get pulsatile hepatomegaly, um, and the cause IV drug users. So if someone's got track marks on their arm um, and a new murmur, well, it's infective endocarditis, but also it's likely to be tricuspid regurgitation. Um, these are some things that we needed to learn, but I don't know if it, you guys need to learn anymore, but just the slides here for completion. So there's ventricular septal defect. You guys can look at this um, later. It's just got the buzzwords. And the last one is a flow murmur, which is when you're anemic. Um, and it's just the question that floats around where they have a systolic murmur and it's a young female that collapses at a party and that's it. Um, look, I haven't been on the JVP, but I think I just wrote everything down so you can look at it in your own time. I don't think we have time, um, fortunately. And then here are some pulses as well, which you can look at your own time. Um, so in terms of infective endocarditis, the things to know um, is that the pathogens, so if it's community acquired, so there's no chance it could be hospital, it's strep viridens. But if it is hospital, or if they're a drug user, it's always skin infections, you know, it's probably because they put a bad cannula in, or they or drug use is staph aureus. And then prosthetic valve is staph emidermis. I don't know, it's not that important. Um, in terms of the valves affected, if it's community acquired, the number one valve is the mitral valve. But if it's IVDU, then it's tricuspid because that's the first valve if you inject things into your veins, the first valve it will hit is the tricuspid. In terms of presentation, you think infective endo if they have a fever and a new murmur, pretty much, or fever and an IV drug user, very likely they're going to have um, endo. Um, in terms of examination findings, there's the weird ones that you actually never see. So there's um, Jane May lesions and Osler's nodes. Um, and the way you remember the difference is like Osler's nodes is owl, like Osler's nodes, and they're, they're, they're painful. Um, and JMA lesions are not painful. Also, the O kind of looks like the tip of your finger. It's kind of like circular, and that's where they're found. Um, and you get splinter hemorrhages as well, which is actually just emboli, little emboli in your fingernails. And in your eyes, you also get Roth spots. In terms of investigations, ECG, the usual stuff, the most important investigation is blood cultures, and you just need to know how to take blood cultures for this, which is you get three different samples, you need two bottles per sample, and each sample should be an hour apart. Um, and then imaging, it's a valvular disease, you're gonna need an echo. In terms of management, um, you just need to remember, wrote, learn this, it's ID, so IV, Benpen, Fluclox, and Gentamicin. Um, it's BFG, I don't know, I don't like infectious diseases, so, but that's what you need to give. Then another thing is rheumatic fever. Does anyone know what rheumatic fever actually is? Yes, so the cause is strep pyogeny. So you get, strep pyogenes usually gives you a throat infection, a strep throat, and then that kind of may resolve or may not resolve, but then in some people, um, they get, you know, they have antibodies attacking the strep pyogenes, but for some reason there's a bit of a mismatch and the antibodies attack your heart as well and cause heart problems. So it's like an autoimmune condition. Um, kind of, yeah, um, similar to like post-strep glomerulonephritis, like it's autoimmune. Um, and so the, the symptoms is the Jones criteria and the Jones criteria also helps as a mnemonic. So you get joint pains, you get ocarditis, which is just like pericarditis, all the carditises. You get nodules, you get erythema marginatum, so a rash, and then later on you may get chorea, so sudden you know, flinging movements. But basically a typical question, it will be an Aboriginal child, um, they'll have a sore throat two weeks ago and suddenly they have joint pain and a rash. Usually they don't present with any heart issues. And, if you, and then sometimes they'll give you that they have a murmur as well, so that makes it super easy that you know it's rheumatic fever. In terms of investigations, um, you can get heart block with it. I don't think it's important for you to know, but the main investigation is anti-streptolysin O antibodies. So these are the antibodies that are causing the problem in your heart. So you really, you can't forget that. And then echo as well, because you've got all these issues. In terms of management, it's kind of symptomatic, like you, you treat, oh, sorry. So another like in, for pathology exams, Ashoff nodules are a buzzword for it. So in terms of treatment, so you treat like every part of the Jones criteria. So they may still have a throat infection, so you give them Benpen. Um, they may have joint pains, you give them aspirin. Uh, aspirin and is the best one for these joint pains. If they have heart failure, you can give Lasix, ACE inhibitors, etc. And if they have the chorea, you give other things. And in terms of prevention, if you've had an attack of rheumatic fever, you need to have Benpen for 10 years after that attack, 
or until you reach 21 years old. So if you're five years old, you have to have it until you're 21. But if you're like 26, you have to have it until you're 36. Um, and so that prevents another ben that prevents another strep throat infection, which would cause another attack of rheumatic fever. Um, and the complication is rheumatic heart disease, which is a different thing. That's if you've had rheumatic fever and you cause a valve problem. And the most common, what's the most common valve problem after rheumatic fever? Mitral stenosis. Great. Okay, so now we're going to run through ECG, just how to read them and what the common things, because you will get an ECG on your exams. You may even get an ECG interpreting OSCE station. Um, so just a quick reminder, you have your sinoatrial node, which goes to your AV node, um, and then you go through um, the bundle branches to do your ventricles, and then just know that there's a P wave, there's a, which is the atrial contraction, and QRS, which is ventricular contraction. Um, and T is ventricular repolarization, not that important. Um, so how do you read an ECG? Well, first you start with general inspection, like with any examination. So you want to make sure you clarify the name, age, and if the patient was in chest pain while doing the ECG. Next, you do the vitals. So that's the um, rate and rhythm and the axis. And I'll give a quick talk on axis in one second. And then to do the rest of the ECG, you just follow the ECG wave and you try and interpret each of those parts. So you look at the P wave, then you look at the PR interval, then you look at the QRS complex, the ST segment, and then the T segment. And that's it. In terms of axis deviation, you don't need to know there's like all the fancy ways of figuring out exactly because all the leads line up. But you just look at lead one and lead two, which are normally on top of each other on the ECG in the top left. If they're both pointing up, that's normal. If they're pointing away from each other, they've left each other, so that's left axis deviation. If they're pointing towards each other, then they're right for each other, so that's right axis deviation. And that's all you need to know, and there's no confusion generally with that. And otherwise, it's just indeterminate if you can't figure it out. So the first step is to look at P waves. So P waves can either be not there, they can be a weird shape, or you can have too many P waves. So if they're not there, you can either have a regular rhythm or an irregular rhythm. So in terms of a regular rhythm, does anyone know what no P waves plus a regular rhythm is? SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, um, and then an irregular rhythm, AF, great. Um, and then if they're a weird shape, they can either be peaked or M-shaped. If they're peaked, it's right atrial hypertrophy. If it's M-shaped, again, that's to do with, with mitral stenosis. And so you know mitral valve is on the left side of your heart, so that's left atrial hypertrophy or mitral stenosis. And if you have too many P waves, that's when you get atrial flutter, and that's when you get the sawtooth. So, what's this? SVT, there are no P waves, but it's a regular rhythm. How do we manage SVT? Valsalva or carotid massage is number one. And then number two is medication, which is adenosine. Great, what's this? Yeah, so basically there's, there's no real P waves. But also, straight away, if the, if the rhythm's irregular or irregularly irregular, then it's AF pretty much no matter what. Um, so all, that's why you always start with rhythm, so you don't get confused and start looking for ST elevation when it's AF. Um, so symptoms of AF, you get palpitations is the main one, but you can get you know, heart failure symptoms. Um, and then the risk, risk factors is anything that causes structural heart change, um, so things that cause heart failure. Um, as well as alcohol, because I can cause dilated cardiomyopathy and stuff. And then what's the main, there's a condition that usually comes with AF or triggers AF. Mm. So when people have attacks of AF, a lot of them are hyperthyroid. So you always need to test for thyroid disease if they've got AF. Um, and the main complication, what's the main complication? Stroke. Our heart failure is a good complication as well, yes. But the main one we're really worried about is a stroke because the atrium is just fibrillating. It's not pumping properly and the blood's circulating and it forms a clot and then it goes straight to your brain, um, which is not good. And you can get the other, um, you can get peripheral arterial disease and gut ischemia. Um, so management of AF is actually quite complicated, but um, I'll break down what you need to know for an intern slash a Monash person. So there's three domains. There's rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation. In most patients, rate control is like first line. You, you mainly want to rate control them. There's not that many people you want to rhythm control. And then you can break it down into acute and chronic. So in the acute situation, 
um, if it's like an um, elderly patient and they're stable, um, hemodynamically stable, you give them metoprolol, which slows down their AF because it's usually really fast, or verapamil if they can't handle it. Um, in terms of rhythm control, if a patient is unstable, no matter how old they are or how long they've had the AF for, because there's all these things with 48 hours, if they're hemodynamically unstable, you DC cardiovert them, no matter what. Um, if they are stable, some people can be car cardioverted, but not you don't usually do it. Usually it's metoprolol. And then in the acute setting, you give them low molecular weight heparin because you're worried about these clots that I talked about. In the chronic section, it's the same thing. So to rate control, most people will be on chronic rate control and they'll be on metoprolol. If they have heart failure, remember heart failure plus AF equals digoxin. So that can come up. In terms of chronic rhythm control, um, some people, like younger patients, you can cardioavert them later down the track, but they need to have anticoagulation for three weeks before and three weeks after with heparin because of the risk of stroke. Like if you cardioavert someone and they have a clot already there, it can just kick it to the brain. So you don't want that to happen. But the main time you'll rhythm control someone is people who have paroxysmal AF. So it just comes on sometimes. In that case, you can give them flecainide pill, which they can take when they feel they have the palpitations. And in terms of anticoagulation, you have to do a chads vas score on someone who has AF to figure out what anticoagulation they need. So in terms of chads vas it's cardiac failure, hypertension, age greater than 75 is two, 65 is two points. Um, I think it is 75, and the other one's 65, I think I wrote that wrong, sorry. D is diabetes, so this is basically just your cardiac risk factors in general. Um, S is a past history of stroke, so obviously you want to anticoagulate someone if they've had a stroke. B is just vascular disease in general. Um, a is age, so that's meant to be 75, gives you two points. Age 65 gives you one point. And then female also are likely more likely to get clots because of hormones and things like that. Um, so basically, look, it's usually pretty easy. So they'll either have quite a lot of these or just none of these. If they have none of them or just one, you consider aspirin as their long-term anticoagulation. If they have two or more, then it's either warfarin or a NOAC. And the way you tell the difference is that if they have a valvular problem, the question says they have a valvular problem, you give warfarin because NOACs can't, are not um, evidence-based for non for valvular problems. But if they have no mention of a valvular issue, then you give a NOAC, so like a Pixaban, a Rivaroxaban, something like that. Um, okay, so does anyone know what this is? There's an arrow to it. So if we look... Um, that's a peaked P wave, right? So we have the S QRS complex, then the T is quite far, and then they have a P, QRS, and the P's are really high, so that's right atrial hypertrophy. And this one's more obvious. These are M-shaped P's, so it's gonna be mitral stenosis or left atrial hypertrophy. What's this? Atrial flutter, you've got way too many P waves and they're sore tooth. Um, all right, in terms of the PR interval, that's the next step to look at. And so um, PR interval can either be too short or it can be too long, which is more common. Does anyone know what happens, what condition gives you too short? Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And then too long give, is AV block, basically. Um, so that's when your AV node is blocked for some reason. So there's first degree, I'll go through what they all look like. The second degree where there are two types. And then there's third degree. Does anyone know why I put third degree and Mobitz type two heart block together. Yes, so if you have either of those, they need a pacemaker, which is easy to remember because it's the two worst types of heart block, so they need a pacemaker, um, a chronic pacemaker. So what's what's the circle showing? Yeah, that's a delta wave. And if you also look, the, there is like no PR interval, it's really short. And so this is Wolf Parkinson White, and that's all you need to know, that that's what it looks like. What's this? So this is type one AV block. So they're all the same length, but it's quite long. It's hard to see from far, but you can see it's more than um, five. It's more than five squares, little squares. What's this? Yeah, Mobitz type one. And so Mobitz type 1, the way that it works is that your PR interval slowly gets longer and longer and longer until it, you have no QRS complex, and then it starts again. So if we look, you know, it's like normal, long, longer, even longer, 
there's that next P wave. There's no QRS here, and then it starts again. So that's Mobit's type one. What's this one? Yeah, so look, I'm going through them sequentially. Um, so it's a bit of a giveaway, but it is it's confusing between Mobit's type two and complete hard block or type three. And there's a way to, um, to figure that out. So with a Mobit's type two, if you look, the PR interval is the same between each QRS complex, and then it drops out. So same, 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 drop. Same, 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 drop. And usually it's in like a pattern, so like two to one, three to one, something like that. Here we go. That shows the size of them. And then Mo this is Mobitz type three. I'll give it away. And the way you can tell um, that it's Mobitz type three is the distance between the P waves. So Mobitz type three is basically when your P waves and your QRS complexes have no association between each other. But between themselves, the P waves are just beating by themselves. So the distance between every P wave is the same. So if you see there's a P here, and then it goes to here, and then it goes to here, and sometimes it's hidden inside the QRS. So the distance between the P is the same, but the difference, the PR interval is different. See, sometimes it's that long, sometimes it's that long. So that's how you tell the difference definitively between Mobitz type two, which has the same PR every time, and complete hard block, which has different PRs. So in terms of AB block, usually you don't have to manage it. It kind of resolves if it's type one or, or Mobitz type one. Um, but if they've you know come in in shock, you do doctor's ABCD, and then the medication they want you to choose in the exam is atropine, which speeds them back up again. And in terms of chronic management, if you have Mobitz two or complete heart block, you need a pace implantable pacemaker. Okay, so the next thing is the um, QRS complex. Um, so why QRS is greater than three squares, and you can tell if they're wide, they look funny. Um, so a wide QRS can either be slow or it can have a fast rhythm. So if you have slow rhythm, it's either going to be a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block or a ventricular ectopic. If it's fast, it's either going to be VT or VFib. And then VT, a subtype of that, is called to sides the point. So what's this? Yeah, so right here, there's this wide QRS. So and it's just one, so it's an ectopic. And in a question, it will be a lady who has a fluttery feeling in her chest, and it lasts for a few seconds, because this only lasts very quickly. If she has a fluttery feeling in her chest and it lasts for a few minutes, that's going to be SVT or AFib, depending on the question. If I give you an irregular pulse, that's AFib. If it's not, it's SVT. So the seconds is important. What is this? So we'll run through it. So this is the QRS. It's wide. It doesn't look normal. And um, the way you work out, so it's a left bundle branch block. So if you have a wide QRS, remember, it's either a topic, left or right bundle branch block. And it's a normal rhythm, um, not fast. So the way you work it out, the way I work it out is you just look at V1, because this was really confusing when I first looked at it. You just look at V1. If V1 is wide and pointing downwards, yeah? So V1 is on the right of your chest. And it's pointing downwards. So all the energy is going away from the right of your chest. And it's going to the left of your chest to overcome that left bundle branch block. So that's how you tell that it's a left bundle branch block. In a right bundle branch block, which we'll see in a second, you look at V1, it'll be wide, but it'll be pointing up. So it'll be really positive V1 wave because all your energy is going towards the right side of your chest to overcome that heart block. That's the way I think of it to remember it. That's not, it's actually almost accurate, but not entirely. Um, the other ways to remember it, which don't work, um, is William. And there's like William Morrow, because in V1, you're meant to see W waves. And in V6, you're meant to see M waves. But like, you don't, there's no W there really. And like, there's no M. You can kind of figure it out, but that doesn't help. So you just look at V1. If, it, if it's wide and high, it's um, right. If it's wide and low, it's left. So here, is an example of it being wide and high. See, it's wide, it's not normal, and it's going up. So it's going towards the right side, so it's a right bundle branch block. What is this? Ventricular tachycardia. So it's wide QRSs and it's going really fast. That's what it is. What's this? Yeah, so it's torsade the point, and which is actually hard to distinguish from VFib. 
and I'll explain that how you do that in a second. But basically, it looks like it's meant to look like that. Not always in real life does it look, but it's pretty close. Um, what's the cause of torsad? So a long QTC, so that's between the start of your Q wave and the end of your T wave. And what's the cause of long QT? Well, yes, but that's iatrogenic. But what's a cause that someone may come in with? Like antidepressants and antipsychotics as well. Good to know for fourth year. Another thing, Hypo, um, hypokalemia and congenital, you can just have congenital long QT. So hypokalemia is an important one. If they say you have a they have a long QT syndrome, in your exams, that's most likely going to be hypokalemia rather than antipsychotics because that's more fourth year. And what's this? Well, it has to be V-fib. The reason you can tell the difference is if you look with the way, like it kind of looks like that, you know, that sign, whatever, that kind of wave thing, but the, they're, they're relatively narrow compared to, if you look here, they're actually quite wide, whereas in V-fib, it's far more narrow, and you also don't get like a very small, like one long, small thing in torsades. It, they'll, in torsades, if you look, they're all ways like that. So that's how you tell the difference. Um, so all these rhythm, these two rhythms I showed can cause cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest is different to a heart attack. Um, I hope we all know. So cardiac arrest is when your heart isn't pumping at all. So no blood is moving. It's at a standstill. It can be caused by a heart attack, but it's not a heart attack. And so there are four rhythms that can cause cardiac arrest. Two shockable ones, two non-shockable ones. And it's important to know which ones you can shock. So which rhythms can you shock? VF and VT. Um, I've got a bit of a star there in one second. And then non-shockable rhythms. Yeah, so you've got asystole and PEA, when your heart is beating maybe normally, maybe abnormally, but you just don't have a pulse. Um, and the common cause of PEA is the tamponade. Um, so in terms of VT, you don't always have to shock them. VF, you always shock them. In terms of VT, if they're hemodynamically unstable, you defibrillate them. If they're stable, and the question will say the patient's stable, you can give them IV amiodarone to reverse their rhythm. Um, but any hemodynamic compromise, so their blood pressure is 80 on 60, you shock them. Even if they're awake, they're most likely not going to be awake. Um, in terms of the causes, you need to know the, um, it's helpful to remember the five P's and the five H's. Um, so I'll just run through them quickly. Um, it's something you just need to memorize. So these can all cause cardiac arrest, trauma, thrombus, cardiac or pulmonary, tension pneumothorax, tamponade, toxins, and then H's, hypoxia, hypothermia, hypovolemia, lots of hypos, hypokalemia, hypoglycemia. Um, just something to remember in your spare time. In terms of management, just very quickly, so it's CPR and defibrillation. In terms of in a hospital, you can also add adrenaline and amiodarone, um, but that's more a fourth year thing, so you'll learn that next year in terms of advanced life support. So um, the next part, so we've done the QRS. The next part is the ST segment. Um, so what are our lateral leads that tells us a lateral MI? One, five, and six mainly in AVL. So there's either you wrote learn that because you just need a note because they most likely give you one. They'll give you one arrhythmia and one ST elevation basically. Um, so, or you can try and remember where the leads actually go um, with a picture or whatever. And then lateral AMI is going to be a circumflex artery stroke, um, stroke a heart attack as well. Um, the anterior leads, so those ones are the easiest to remember because you know you put the V1, 2, 3, 4 on the front of your chest, so that's what they are. Oh, that's, so that's where the lateral leads are on the thing. V1 to 4, and that's the lad, the anterior descending artery, and so they're there. Maybe if this helps you remember where they are, depends how you learn things. Two, three, AVF are your inferior leads. Easy, AVF is at your foot so that you can remember that, and then two and three, and that's your right coronary artery. So a question could ask if it's lateral, it could ask what artery. Um, in terms of ST elevation, just sometimes things look like ST elevation, but they aren't. So you have to look at the what's called the J point, and that helps you tell, because um, sometimes the, the T wave is really high, and you're like, oh, it's ST elevation. It's not. If that J point where the you know the S finishes and the ST starts, that's what you look for. Um, and then you want to look for two contiguous leads. So that means two of these in a row need to be present. If it's just one lead, it's nothing. 
Um, and also to help you, if you look for SCE depression as well, it confirms it's more likely an AMI. Um, otherwise, because the other differential is pericarditis, where you have global ST elevation, which is often hard to see. Um, and so if you find ST depression in some other leads, then it's more likely an AMI. Um, so what's this? Okay, so it's a trick, trick question because it's pericarditis because um, there's no ST depression anywhere and you see like ST elevation V2, V3, V4, V5, C6 as well as 1 and 2 and AVL. Like there's, it doesn't make sense in terms of areas. Like they're all kind of elevated. So that's one clue. The other one is that they look, some of them are saddle shaped. So they do like this U thing. But that doesn't. That can be a normal um, AMI, and also you see PR depression. Um, so like here, you can see PR that's dipping down. That's also a sign of pericarditis. What is this? Yeah, great. So there's T wave inversion. I think there was some ST depression somewhere. So this is a non-STEMI. So you've got some non-specific T wave inversion basically, and you don't have any ST elevation. So it's just an but there are ECG changes. I mean, it could be unstable angina, but usually a question will only give you n STEMI. Um, so, where is the ST Okay, yeah, so the, the, oh, it's here. So, if you look, this is the PR line, that's the isometric line, and this is the ST segment, and it's lower. Yeah? yeah? Um, so, always compare to the PR line, that's the isoelectric line, and that's how you figure out where the depression elevation is. Um, this one's a tricky one as well. So like one kind of red herring is it here, this kind of looks elevated, but look at these two leads, they're not elevated. So that's not ST elevation, that's on STEMI. Um, what it is, is if you look here, this is the Q part of the QRS complex. And um, just an extra thing is that if you have deep Q waves, so that means that they're more than half the size of the um, of the R wave, then that's an old AMI, and you can see that in two, three, and AVF, they're all deep. So that's an old inferior AMI because you've got the contiguous leads. Over here, you could get confused that maybe this is a Q wave, but if you see a little peak before the Q wave, that means that that's actually just the R wave. Um, so that's not a deep Q. And then this is another in old AMI, but where is it? So it's tricky, but it's in V1, V2, V3, because there's no peak, there's no peak before that down. So that is a true Q wave. Because um, if we look here, see there was a peak, so that's not a Q wave. No peak, no Q, that is a Q wave. And so it's an old anterior MI. Um, what's this? So we've moved on from the ST segments. There's only one thing left. So these are crazy high T waves. And there's no ST elevation really. They're just, it's kind of around there. But the T waves are crazy high, which means it is hyperkalemia. And remember, hypokalemia was long QT, hyperkalemia, hyper T waves. Um, okay, so quickly on peripheral vascular disease. So I'm going to cover this. Um, so in terms of a deep vein thrombosis, um, so we've got Virchow's triad, so that's, or Virchow's, um, so that's when you have endothelial damage, venous stasis, and hypercoagulability, you're more likely to get a clot. And then these three categories are good to remember because they help you remember the risk factors to develop a DVT. So endothelial damage, if you've had a major surgery, so they've cut things up, or you've had a motor vehicle accident, you're likely to get a DVT or a PE. Venous stasis, so that's things like immobility and having a long surgery or having a long plane flight, that falls there. And hypercoagulable states, so there's inherent ones, so that's factor something, factor C and S deficiency, von Willebrand deficiency. And then there's, um, or maybe it's not one band, it's antiphospholipid, sorry, in fact, the I don't know that. And then malignancy, pregnancy, and on the pill are all hypercoagulable states. 
So the pill is often one they like to sneak in and then they'll get a DVT or a PE. Um, the problem with the DVT is it looks like cellulitis. So it, because you have a red inflamed calf, it's swollen and hot, like that's the same as cellulitis. So how do you tell? On examination, kind of tricky. Um, maybe if they have a fever, more likely cellulitis. If it's a high fever, maybe regular borders. You can also do something called home enzyme, which we don't recommend anymore, where you like pull their foot back and it causes pain, but that can dislodge the clot and it can go to your lungs. So it's kind of silly. Um, the best way to determine if this is cellulitis or DVT is to take a history and then basically all those risk factors before you ask them, so you would ask them all in the OSCE station, and that's called a well score. And that tells you if they have a few risk factors, it's more likely a DVT. If they have less than three or very little risk factors, that that's an indication to a D-dimer, which kind of checks if you have any active clots. That's the only time you do a D-dimer. D-dimers don't help otherwise. They help you rule it out. So if you think, oh, this is most likely cellulitis, do a D-dimer. If they have risk factors, then you do a venous duplex ultrasound, which tells you if there's a clot there. Um, and also, it's always important to check their clotting factors and everything if they have a clot, because why? maybe they have an inherited condition. But the worry with a DVT is that you get a PE. Um, so what are the main symptoms of a PE? Yeah, so basically it's kind of vague. It's just sudden onset shortness of breath, sudden onset chest pain, usually with the risk factors we talked about. And um, sometimes hemoptysis, but very rare. But if you see hemoptysis in the question, then it's most likely going to be a PE if it's sudden. Um, and also the pain's pleuritic. So anything lung related is usually pleuritic, um, plus pericarditis. And the main examination finding is tachycardia and tachypnea. That's it. So usually in the question, they will be tachycardic. In terms of the chest x-ray, it's normal pretty much always. You can sometimes see wedge-shaped infarcts or other things, not important. It's normal. So they'll have a normal x-ray. In terms of their ABG, they'll have alkalosis because they're, they're short of breath and they're breathing out all their CO2, so they'll be alkalotic. What's the main change on the ECG? Sinus tachycardia, S1, Q3, T3, not common at all. Um, the other thing is very common is a right bundle branch block and a right axis deviation because you know, there's a blockage in a vessel in your lungs, which is supplied by the right heart. So you're going to have right heart problems. That's how I remember it. Um, the definitive um, investigation is either a CTPA or a VQ. When do you choose CTPA? First line is CTPA. When do you choose a VQ? If they're pregnant or if they have, no, that's it. If they're pregnant um, or if they have kidney failure, sorry, because you use contrast. And if someone has a sudden collapse post-operation, they have a saddle embolus until proven otherwise. So that's where it covers the two main arteries supplying the lungs. In terms of management for a thrombus, so acute, always doctors ABCD. For most PEs, you would just give them heparin to manage it. If they have a PE, the answer is heparin. If they have a saddle PE, so sudden collapse post-operation, then you have to do surgery or thrombolysis. In terms of chronic management, um, it's warfarin, and you just have to kind of remember how long you give warfarin for. So if it's a provoked DVT, which means they have risk factors, they went on a long flight, they go to DVT, that's six weeks. But if it was an unprovoked, so they just randomly got it, that's three months. And then PE is more serious. So even if they had risk factors for it, but they got it, it's still three months. But if they had risk, no risk factors and they got it, then it's six months. And then if they have had two PEs or they have one of those blood problems, then they have lifelong warfarin. But the question is, what if they have recurrent PEs despite being on warfarin? What do you do? Does anyone know? So the last line therapy, if this comes up, is an IVC filter. So you put like a filter on your inferior vena cava and it stops all the clots from getting to your heart. Then there's peripheral arterial disease. So as I mentioned earlier, stable angina and peripheral arterial intermittent claudication is the same thing. One's in your heart, one's in your leg. Um, so that's pain in calves on walking and it's relieved by rest. If it's relieved by bending over, if you have pain in your calves, it's relieved by bending over. Does anyone know what that is? So that's called neurogenic claudication and it's because of spinal stenosis. So if the question says that, then it's not intermittent claudication from heart. Um, this you can look in your own time. So in terms of critical limb ischemia, so that's a heart attack of your legs. Um, and so the way to remember the symptoms is the six Ps. So that's like 
I always struggle with them, like pallor, pulseless, um, perishingly cold, paralysis, um, yeah, pain, and paresthesia. Um, so these will be hinted at. The worst one is paralysis. If they got paralysis, they need urgent vascular surgery. So the main management is vascular surgery. They come and they open up the arteries. Um, but you can also give heparin as usual if it's a clotting thing. So ulcers are really important um, to know. So the way to differentiate, I'm just going to go through the quick things to differentiate. So usually they have risk factors for venous disease, as we talked about, or arterial disease. Um, neuropathic or diabetic ulcers, so they'll have diabetes. Then in terms of distribution, venous ulcers are usually buzzwordy on the medial malleolus. Arterial ulcers are usually on the distal toes because they have the smallest blood vessels. And neuropathic ulcers are usually on your heels or the balls of your foot because they're painless and they're just kind of pressing too hard. Appearance, venous ones are irregular and they have brown skin around them. Arterial ones are regular circles and they have a punched out appearance. And then neuropathic are kind of a mix between. But the key thing with a neuropathic or a diabetic ulcer is that they're painless. Um, in terms of pain, so venous should not have any rest pain. Um, but if they do have some pain, it's decreased with elevation. But arterial will be increased with elevation because, you know, the blood supply will be worse. And then neuropathic, there's no pain. So management is wound care for all of them, wound care, wound care, wound care. And then with venous, you want to get the blood flowing, so you give elevation compression. Arterial, you refer to vascular search, and neuropathic, you take care of the diabetes. They're usually infected, so you have to give them antibiotics. So what is this one? Yes, what's this one? Arterial, because it's a regular punched out, and this one's on the medial malleolus. So it's going to be a venous. And it's also like irregular, more irregular than that one, and less punched out. OK, last thing, which we're running a bit over time. Apologies. Um, but we'll cover chest pain, because that's the main cardiac complaint. So differentials of chest pain, the best way to go through it is you just go through all the things that are in your thorax. So you've got your bones and muscles, <laughs> the most important one first, um, cardio, rest, GIT, which is just like esophagus, and other. So what are MSK causes of chest pain? Costochondritis, MSK, or a rib fracture. Um, so muscle, yeah, muscle strain is usually the most common cause. Um, and the way you can tell it's that is if they can touch it and it hurts, or if it hurts on certain movements. Um, in terms of cardio, so there's quite a few, obviously angina, valvular disease, pericarditis, tamponade, and aneurysm, I'll go through those really quickly. In terms of rest, hopefully Darren covered them all, so P, pneumonia, pneumothorax. And you can tell it's a rest condition because it's pleuritic or pericarditis. These four are pleuritic. So the, one of the first questions you should ask is, is it pleuritic? Because then you narrow it down really easily. Also, muscle strain can be pleuritic, but that's usually much more obvious because you can tell it's a muscle strain. In terms of JIT, it could be gourd or gastritis, esophageal spasm, doesn't matter. Other causes is psychogenic. So they're, they're hyperventilating and they can get chest pain and all sorts of crazy symptoms. And they usually have tingles in their fingertips because they're hyperventilating. Or shingles sometimes comes up, but that would be pretty obvious that they had a rash or they had, you know, um, burning pain. So quickly, aortic dissection. So that's different to atherosclerosis in that it's between the intima and the media. Or it's, it's inside the media and you get a tear there and then blood flows into it. The risk factors are the same risk factors, the cardiac risk factors, plus there's some extra ones, so Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos, you know, you get all stretchy and all your vessels become stretchy as well. Um, in terms of presenting in a question, an obvious presentation would be that they have tearing pain and it's either in chest pain or they can have back pain. And if it's chest pain, it's usually part the anterior um, the aorta, the ascending aorta, sorry, and if it's back pain, it's usually the descending aorta. A less obvious one, would be chest pain plus neurological symptoms. So that's something that can come if they have like weird chest pain, but weird signs that you can't explain, it's likely a dissection. In terms of examination, you get the left, right blood pressure differential or the weak pulses on your left side because the blood's not going there very well. And you get aortic regurgitation because sometimes the dissection can spread into your aortic valve. Um, management, not that important for you guys. So pre-surgery, they, um, beta blocker and they need blood transfusions and stuff. And so there's two types, there's type A and type B. Type A involves the ascending um, aorta. It can involve just the ascending or both, but that's type A. 
Type A only involves descending. Type A is usually easier to treat, so you can just put a stent if they're not dying, or uh, otherwise surgery is the main management. Okay, then the other kind of aneurysmal kind of thing is AAA, triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So there's, it can occur in different cases on, uh, places on the aorta, but the main, the number one place it occurs is your infrarenal, like beneath your renal vessels. Um, there's three types, not that important. Risk factors, exactly the same. Cardio risk factors, then stretchy risk factors. Um, there's two other ones. So syphilis, having a previous syphilis um, infection, increases a risk for a thoracic um, aneurysm. So that's um, a path, more a path question in paper two. And then being female increases your risk of rupture, um, whereas being male increases risk of having it. Um, so in terms of um, symptoms of a non-ruptured aneurysm, so for it to be classified an aneurysm, it has to be greater than um, three centimeters. Um, if it's non-ruptured, the symptoms are nothing. Or if they're really skinny, that you may be able to feel one, but no one who has this is going to be skinny because they have the cardio risk factors. Um, that just <laughs> not trying to be harsh. I mean, that's just the truth. Like you don't feel it. Um, but then if it's ruptured, you get a triad of symptoms, um, and they're kind of obvious. You get hypotension because the blood's going everywhere. You get back pain because the blood's kind of in your abdominal cavity and it goes everywhere. And you get a pulsatile mass, which is spurting blood out. Um, Investigation, the number one investigation is an ultrasound. You don't need to do any fancy CT, you do a quick ultrasound to confirm. Um, they'll be wheeled off to theatre. So obviously if they've ruptured, you do surgery. But people may be found incidentally on like a CT abdo because they have you know, pancreatitis or something, and then they find this. So when do you give surgery to someone who's asymptomatic? Yeah, greater than 5.5 centimetres or greater than one centimeter a year if it's growing really fast. So if, you, if they find it incidentally, then they'll be tracking it every year. And if it's growing oh, every so often um, with ultrasound, if it grows too fast, they'll also do surgery. So you can, um, so if it's not too fast, you can do regular surveillance. Otherwise, they can either do open surgery or repair. Um, so pericarditis, so we know that it's chest pain, sharp and burning. Things that make it better is leaning forward. So that's a good question to ask. And um, things that make it worse is not leaning forward. Um, but, <laughs> but also, it's pleuritic. So remember, there's the four causes of pleuritic chest pain plus minus MSK. So it's a good question to ask. In terms of history, it could be because of Dressler's syndrome. Or often, they'll have a viral illness beforehand. And then they'll have chest pain, and they'll be younger. Um, and an examination, the only thing you really hear is pleural fiction rub sometimes. Um, ECGs, you will find the pericarditis changes and the management's hydros NZ. The final chest pain thing is a tamponade, which is a very big emergency. So that's when blood goes into your pericardial sac, which is usually either because of a ventricular rupture or because of aortic dissection or some sort of trauma, um, which I, yeah. So, or pericarditis sometimes, because your pericardium is inflamed, and when things are inflamed, they become swollen and edematous. So that's why you actually need to do an echo um, in anyone who has pericarditis to make sure they're not going to start developing a tamponade. Um, I don't know what that says underneath there. Oh, in terms of the symptoms they have, um, so they'll have um, chest pain, but it won't be exertional, it won't really be pleuritic, and then they'll collapse. Um, and the key thing in the question is if they've had chest pain and they're not responding to resus, so fluid resus, then it's most likely a tamponade because um, all the fluid is just going straight there and it's not helping. Um, and stopping your heart even more, basically. Um, and then in terms of examination, there's a triad. Does anyone know what it's called? Beck's triad. So um, you get muffled heart sounds, which makes sense because the fluid's in the way. You get distended neck veins because your heart can't beat as much. So you get quick heart failure and your JVP rises. And then you get hypotension because all your blood's going into the heart sac. Um, and then in terms of investigation, the uh, examination, the other thing you can get is pulses paradoxes, and that's in my pulses table, which you can look at your own time. Um, something you don't get is Kuzmal sign, as I said earlier, that is not a sign of tamponade, that's a sign of constrictive pericarditis or restrictive cardiomyopathy. In terms of the ECG, does anyone know what an ECG would look like on someone like this? Yeah, so you get something called electrical alternance, because the way you think about it is the heart's kind of swinging in the sack of fluid, so sometimes you get big ones, and sometimes you get small contractions, depending where it is in the fluid. And also, overall, it's actually quite small as well, because it's compressed by all the fluid. It can't really pump. 
Um, and all the time, there'll be pulses as pulseless as well. So cause of pulseless electrical activity, the main cause is tamponade. In terms of management, what's the management? You stab him with a needle. Pericardiosynthesis is another name to say that. Um, so this is a table you can look at, which just goes through everything I said. And this is just other differentials, um, which you can look at because I've run out of time. Um, and there are some questions there as well. So that is it. Does anyone have any questions or anything? Okay, hopefully that explained everything. Um, feel free to talk to me now or message me on Facebook if you have questions. Um, there's one, actually one really quick question I wanted to go through because I went on your Kami and I saw that people weren't getting this right. Um, what was it? Did I put it in? Oh, here, this one. A patient has ongoing chest pain consistent with acute coronary syndrome. He has persistent symptoms despite adequate anticoagulation um, and treatment with aspirin. He also has a history of asthma. So he has anti ad adequate anticoagulation. So he has his, we assume he has his aspirin and his clopidogrel if he needs it. So clopidogrel is not the answer. Um, he's on the aspirin. So what's the main drug you need to start with angina? Yeah, so beta blocker, but he has asthma. So the answer is a calcium channel blocker. Um, which is amlodipine. I guess it's the best option. Ideally, you'd want a um, centrally acting one, but the answer is amlodipine because it does have central effects as well. All right, that's all. Sorry. Yeah. That's a question. Why is it not Prazosin? Um, like an alpha blocker. It just because the problem isn't hypertension. If it was thought they're talking about hypertension, that's prazosin would help. But it's more a heart problem, so you want one of the you want a beta blocker basically. But they don't have that. So why is it not the ACE? Because it's not hypertension once again. It's um, just I'm a lot of pain. I feel like. On ATG, it says calcium channel block. Yeah. I know, but like, I know it's frustrating. Myocardial like, oxygen supply. Yeah. Myocardial demand. So you want rapamil, You don't want. Yeah, uh, you you want rapamil, but the best we have is a lot of pain because we we need that beta blocker help, and we don't have that in the question at all. And we don't know if he has high blood pressure or anything. So we want um, the calcium channel block. Okay. It's a tr tricky slash bad question. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. So there was a um, question about the young guy who's got like a viral like, yeah. upper respiratory tract infection of some sort. And people are tossing up, and then he gets like pericarditis or yeah. symptoms. Is people are tossing up between pericarditis and Bornholm syndrome. And one of the 50 years told us that it was Bornholm because Bornholm gives you like. Viral. Do you, you can, can you send me the question? Yeah. I'll just say the exact wording. Yeah, I'll it. send it to you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. That's all right. Yeah. Do you use petrol? Yes. I thought you use the amyl No, it is atropine or EPG. Uh, and one okay. usually follows EPG. So you use atropine? Yeah. Heart block. Yeah, I, AV I, block. I got into a huge debate with another fourth year person who was like, oh, you use the asthma action guidelines, you don't use ETG, you use a stroke line. No, no, ETG is the best resource that we have I'll, with I'll, Monash. I'll, I'll tell them this first question about the anticoagulants, uh, so we assume that when we say anticoagulant, we're going to ask you about attribute. Yeah. No, 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 He has no reason to be on heparin. Why not Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. Yeah, that's fine. Also, the other one. Yeah, and um, it's yeah. it's essential as well because well, the issue is that it's we all go naive with that, like ruling out everything. I know they do say after it's anti platelet as well. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's not a good question. I don't think it's a good question, but most likely they want you to. They try. They're saying we've done that. We want to. Thanks. Stop. Thank you so much. No I, problem. I hate cardio, yeah. and now I don't. Okay, hopefully, that's so, the point. Yeah, lots of cardio. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, please do. Please do. That's the point. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Let's come over here. Let's set up. Thanks so much for presenting. Are you, are you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, like, I'm just going to be able to I don't need that to Okay, amazing. <laughs> It's like, is this a mic? This is um, the recording, and then this is the one that projects it. Oh, I know. Let's give them a few minutes to that. Yeah, just to settle. Yeah. Thanks so much. No worries. I'm not being... No, no, that's all good. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all good, all good, all good. All right, guys, we might make a start so that you guys can get out of here. So I'm going to be talking about rheumatology and MSK. Fortunately, in the exam, this is actually not that big of a topic. So if you guys are running out of time and trying to work out how to prioritize your study time, I would mostly focus on the topics that have been covered today. So things like your cardio, rest, and diet. In saying that, a lot of the rheumatoid questions are very repetitive. So if you have a look at the Quella um, questions that have been released, they're pretty similar year to year. So um, it's kind of like a thing that you can sort of get free marks towards your exams. In saying that, room is quite big on the OSCEs. So every year there's been an MSK-based exam, except for our year, because they like to change things around for our year. So I would really recommend knowing your MSK exams back to front. Um, so your hip, knee, shoulder ones, they're all your second year ones, or first and second year ones, so they're your MSK ones. The thing that was different this year is hand, and hand is usually a rheumatological hand exam. So most of you would have learned your hand exam on the wards through doctors and looking online. I was thinking about whether I should go through with it with you guys, but from what I've learned from my study with my friends is that we everyone has sort of a different way of approaching it. So the way I approach it is I look at, obviously, you know, start off with the general appearance and go down to the hands. And then I go disease specific. So when I'm looking at the general appearance of the hand, I'll be like, okay, I'm looking for osteoarthritis signs, I'm looking for rheumatoid signs. Whereas other people go joint by joint and talk about each joint in, and what they find at each joint. So ultimately it's up to you guys which way you go. I wouldn't recommend changing your system at this time. Um, so whatever system you have right now, just go with it. Just a couple of things with OSCEs. Just like if you walk into a rest exam, you take a few minutes to look around the room to see if there's any puffers or things like that. Do the same thing in an MSK exam. So take the first few seconds to calm your calm yourself down and just look around the room because sometimes there'll be clues around the room. So for example, if it's a patient, you have to do a hip exam and there's OA, they might have things like walkers and crutches around the room. And so just having those clues already sort of guides you to what the diagnosis is in terms of what the examiner wants. So our year, we didn't have an MSK exam, but we did have an osteoporosis stem, which was essentially 
someone's got a DEXA scan, so you have to interpret the DEXA scan and tell them that they have a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Then you have to go through their risk factors and explain how they developed osteoporosis and try and work out which ones are relevant to them. And then you had a brief section on management, which is your basic osteoporosis management as well. Okay, so generally we'll be covering all of these topics today. Some of them I've covered in a lot more detail than others just to reflect how the faculty also weighs them. All right, so how do we classify joint pain? So a lot of you guys will know this. I think this is a good system to keep in your mind. So the majority of classification of joint pain will be in your OSCEs. So if you can spurt out something along these lines at the end of your um, at the end of your OSCE station, you will look really good. So instead of saying, for example, osteoarthritis in the knee, if you can say it's a monoarticular, non-inflammatory, non-symmetrical, um, acute or chronic, depending on the stem, seronegative arthritis, most likely consistent with OA, you will sort of bump up your OSCE mark that little bit. Because remember, OSCEs are all a game, right? Like the examiners are there, they have this marking scheme, but I can guarantee you by like 2 p.m. they're all exhausted. So you just have to sort of play to your strengths and make yourself look good. And ultimately you're gonna bump up your marks there when the examiner thinks of, your, thinks of you as a competent medical student, if that sort of makes sense. Okay, so this is a slide I took off Nicole Carter, who's one of the um, students in the years above. And so I thought this is a really good way of sort of classifying joint pain and having a system of understanding joint pain. So as you can see, most of room is about your inflammatory joint pain, but don't forget your non-inflammatory ones, which is predominantly in the exam osteoarthritis, but they can have things like trauma. So so you split them off, so you've got your non-inflammatory ones, and then you go down the inflammatory pathway. So now you want to work out whether it's affecting lots of joints in the body or if it's affecting some. In terms of the differenti differentiation, technically mono means one and oligo means few. Usually we say four or less is a definition of oligo and five or more is a definition of poly. So split them off, so try and work out if it's one joint or many joints or few and then work out if it's acute and chronic. And having the system in your head will be really helpful in terms of approaching an OSCE station with a stem on the door says someone presents with joint pain. So if you if they say it's an acute onset joint pain, you're already thinking, okay, it might be an OA, it might be an OA, it might be septic arthritis, it might be gout. So those are sort of ways of thinking about it. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you guys will already know this, but a brief refresher on inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. So these are the things that you really want to elicit in your history. So when the OSCE asks your history, these are the questions you sort of want to ask. So inflammatory joint pain all has all that inflammation within the joint. So usually overnight that inflammation gets worse because you're just resting. And so the inflammatory cells are just resting. But then after you start to move around, you sort of squeeze those inflammatory cells out of that joint. Um, so it can take a long time. Then no one's going to say in the EMQ, like this patient has 31 minutes and the joint stiffness goes away because that's just confusing. Usually for inflammatory joint pains, it can take over an hour. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be like 25 versus 35. It's going to be like 10 minutes versus over an hour. And that sort of helps you make your differentiation. So of course, in keeping in line with that, inflammatory joint pain is worse in the morning or after long periods of rest, whereas non-inflammatory, so your classic OA, is going to be worse when you do activities or in the evening. So these are all your cardinal signs of inflammation that we learned all the way back in first year. And so they're going to be associated with your inflammatory conditions rather than your non-inflammatory. Um, in terms of your inflammatory markers, so these are the tests that you'll do in order in an OSCE. Um, they will be raised in inflammatory markers. Non-inflammatory is uncommon to be raised, but depending on which one, it can have some slight raising if it's an acute event. The major examples of inflammatory that you guys will need to know is your rheumatoid arthritis and your SLE, and your non-inflammatory is OA. Okay, so uh, what, what do you want to know on history? Just a point, so um, what I found with OSCEs and doing OSCEs in third year was that given that we learned about cluster questions for the first time in third year, a lot of students go into a STEM and they start off with their cluster questions. So it might be a 60 year old lady presenting with acute onset of pain and they'll jump straight to the OA cluster questions. What you need to do is you need to still go back to your basics. So you need to get your history of presenting complaint, develop your history of presenting complaint, and then go into a cluster question. Does that sort of make sense? So by the end of the history of presenting complaint, it might be quite obvious it's OA. So then you might not have that many OA cluster questions left, but you can still ask about things like risk factors and stuff, and then go into clusters for trauma, gout, and all that. But don't go in there, ask like two lines, and then jump straight into your cluster questions, because you really want to develop that history. And if you've got a really good history, the diagnosis is usually pretty obvious. So with rheumatological conditions, you really need to know about the distribution of where the pain is. So you want to know which joints are effective. So if someone said, for example, in um, rheumatoid arthritis, that their proximal joints are more effective, 
don't just leave it there. The better student will think about the distribution of RA and ask about those things as well. So you can specifically ask and that can be part of your clustering if you, if you see it like that. Then you also want to know when did the joint pain start? Because a one day history of pain will generate a completely different list of differentials compared to um, a one month or a one year, if that makes sense. Then try and nail down what it feels like. Um, does it ever change? Does it ever go away? It's a night pain, et cetera. Try to get them to rate the pain and, and then go back to your AAB. So what aggravates the pain? Is it rest? Is it activity? Um, was any trauma to the pain or does trauma make the pain worse? And then what alleviates it? So is it elevation? Is it resting? Is it heat packs and things like that? Associated symptoms is where you can sort of flush, start to flesh out those cluster questions. Um, so with OA, you want to know about their risk factors. So are there associated um, things like are they obese or rheumatoid is, you know, um, inflammation of other synovial fluids. So things like your heart and your lungs, so you can ask about shortness of breath and chest pain here. In terms of beliefs, it's something um, everyone's really guilty of skipping over, but I think it's a really easy question to just ask. So what do you think this might be? And then the sim patient will be like, oh, my mom, sister and brother all have RA. So I'm worried it's that. And it'll give you a really good clue without having to go into your family history. Okay, in terms of the key things, so obviously with your joint, you want to ask all of the sino so all of the inflammation signs, and really try and nail down what they can and can't do. Then you look at your systemic signs. So a lot of rheumatological conditions don't just affect the joints; they have a systemic sort of pathology associated with them. So you really want to know: Are they losing weight? Do they have a rash? And that here is your SLE signs. So do they have chest pain and shortness of breath? This is your Shrogan. So do they have a dry eyes, mouth, or a female can ask about a dry vagina as well? And this is your reactive arthritis. So have they traveled anywhere recently? Any young male tra traveling to Vietnam and has sexual intercourse is going to be reactive arthritis in your EMQs. So you can ask about those in your OSCEs as well. With room, these are really, really, really easy marks. So room is all about limitation to daily activities. And in the OSCE, you just want to really play up that empathy factor. So ask them about the impact of their life, specifically what they can't and can't do. So really want to nail down the activities of daily living. Can they shower? Can they walk? Can they dress themselves? Can they eat? Because with really advanced rheumatoid arthritis, they can't you know, lift things like forks and spoon and can have a quite a debilitating effect on their life. And if you get those details, you can incorporate it into your management plan. So you can say things like, I'd like to have an occupational therapist on the team to work with those things. Then past history. So some of these rheumatological conditions will be associated with other autoimmune conditions. So ask them if they've had a personal history, thyroid, celiac, diabetes, inflammatory bowel. Ask them if anyone in the family has them. Um, and so just don't forget those th three things. Okay, so here's where the money maker is for EMQs. The way I tried it really hard last year for things like of stories and things like that to try and remember it, but it didn't work out. I think it's just really hard to remember all of these things as a list. You guys, your exams are on the 11th, right? Yeah, so you have like about two-ish weeks. What I recommend is instead of studying room serology as a list, as a specific study session, it's just like wake up in the morning and learn one of these. And that's it. That's the one that you learn for that day. And then the next day study it, to study the next one and add it to your list. Because if you study all of these as a list, I can guarantee you that you're going to get confused between the different types of antibodies. So I would recommend, for example, today, say I want to learn the ones about SLE. So I want to know it's double-stranded DNA antibody. And then just learn that one today. And then tomorrow go down to lupus. So that's, that's sort of how I did it and sort of a way to make sure that you don't get confused. Because in the EMQ, um, they'll usually give you the antibody. Even without the antibody, you can probably get the diagnosis. But if the antibody is there, it's just like a free mark. Okay, so I thought the way I do my presentation is by OSCE, sort of cases, so that we can get some OSCE revision in as well. So you have a 45-year-old male who's presenting with a one-day history, acute onset of a red hot swollen knee joint. He's also febrile. So what is your major differential? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else it could be? Yeah, anything else? Mm -hmm. Perfect, really good. So I just have a little thing here. You guys did really well. I think one of the things about OSCE stations is trying to work out what are they trying to test. So in a station, like say this was your STEM, 90% of you will get that it's septic arthritis. That's not going to be the differentiating factor between the students. The differentiating factor is going to be, okay, I think most likely this is septic arthritis but I need to rule out gout, I need to rule out trauma, acute trauma to the joint or reactive arthritis. So it's going to be about incorporating that into your history. That sort of makes sense. So you guys had all of those ones, which is really, really good. Okay, so getting to the point at the end of the year when everyone's really exhausted, I like to think about why do I actually care about this condition? Why am I even studying it? 
So <laughs> with septic arthritis, the major reason that we're caring about this condition is because it's an actual medical emergency. So with, that, with the other rheumatological conditions, if you miss a diagnosis on day one, and they present to ED, they should be fine. But with septic arthritis, this is something that it can really escalate um, quite quickly. So you can destroy the joint within hours, and then that sepsis can seed out into the body, so they can get acute sepsis as well. So it has actually quite a significant mortality rate. It's one in 10, so it's quite significant. And if you miss the diagnosis and don't treat it promptly, a lot of these people will be left with long lasting damage. So this is one of the ones where you sort of have to have it at the back of your mind always in real life as well. So septic arthritis in real life is often like a sudden onset. Sometimes you can't sort of work out why particular patients have got it, but these are good sort of words to sort of drop into your OSCE. So ask, low SES is sort of a hard one to ask in the OSCE, but you can ask them if, um, if they are alcohol, so how much alcohol they drink, do they have diabetes, do they have underlying joint problems? So the major one associated with septic arthritis is rheumatoid. Um, do they have any joint prosthesis? Because that will severely increase um, their risk. And if they're IBDU, so do they have like a source of that sepsis? In terms of the clinical presentation, so as we've all discussed, it's those signs of inflammation. So you'll have that red, tender, hot, swollen joint, and usually there won't be any trauma. There might be a minor trauma, like they might have like scratched their knee or something as a way for the bacteria to enter. But usually the buzzword is there's no obvious trauma to the joint. 85% of them will only have one joint affected, usually the knee, but 15% can have multiple joints affected. So just keep that in mind. So in terms of the pathogens, so Zach tomorrow is going to go through ID a lot more, but just to have a highlight here of what actually causes it, any young sexually active individual, so if they're like 28 years old and they're male, it's going to be nice zero gonorrhea. So you want to treat it with keftriaxone. And otherwise, if they're just like a 60-year-old with a long history of rheumatoid, it's going to be staph aureus, which makes sense because it's just skin organism. So that's what's going to enter into the joint and sort of mediate that sepsis. So if they have risk factors like they're immunosuppressed, um, then you might be thinking, okay, it might be MRSA, so you give them some bank. But otherwise, you can usually get away with using flucox if it's sensitive. So that's sort of a picture of what it looks like in real life. So, I mean, it's quite impressive, but you can see why some people might miss it. Okay, in terms of management, okay, so OSCEs are all about showing that you're competent. In real life, you, we're not going to be managing septic arthritis as an intern. We're sort of going to be the um, person who might see it as ED and refer it to the appropriate people. So I wouldn't ever underestimate the value of always sort of starting any OSCE by saying, I make sure that this, the patient's stabilized. So do your doctor's ABCD for every patient and also ensure that you refer to appropriate people. So you'd be like, if I saw this in the ED, I want to make sure that the appropriate people, senior people are involved in managing it in a safe environment. That will literally give you two marks at the start and something easy to drop into every station. So yeah, you want to make sure the patient's stabilized because they might have septic arthritis, but they might become septic. So you want to make sure that they're stable. You need to admit these patients. Usually it's at a gen med, but if, you have a, if you're an Alfred or something like that, which has a room team, then you can also have room involved as well, if they, often if they have underlying joint problems. If they have a prosthetic joint, because it's, a, it's an artificial joint, you need to get orthopedic involved. So orthopedics will take them to surgery, um, to an OT, where they'll do a sterile joint aspirate. So you must remember that. Obviously, give them analgesia because they're in pain. Give them blood culture and do a joint aspirate. Okay. So obviously, managing septic arthritis, we want to give them antibiotics. Does anyone know if we give them, when we give them in this sort of one, two, three, four? When do we give antibiotics? Okay, okay, so do you give blood cultures, antibiotics, joint aspirate? Okay. I mean, like, ideal word is blood cultures, joint aspirate, antibiotics, but you, you, like, you need someone who can do joint aspirate, so it takes a lot of time to get someone to blood cultures, meningitis. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, does anyone have any um, differing opinions? Okay. So meningitis is sort of the one where you give blood um, antibiotics immediately if you're within 30 minutes of them presenting. Septic arthritis is actually you do the joint aspirate first, okay? So you get them in hospital, get the blood cultures, but the most important thing is the joint aspirate. Does anyone have an idea of why we would do the joint aspirate first? You want to make it a mindset and basically give it to the septic arthritis in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. So if you give antibiotics to this patient, what you want to do is you want to destroy the majority of that bacteria in the joint, which is really good. You do want to destroy that joint, but it's really useless in terms of stratification of what antibiotics we give to that patient. 
with joint um, with septic arthritis, you usually have a little bit more time because before they become floridly septic, like they are in meningitis. So it's not necessarily we want to protect this person from dying. We're more likely we want to protect this joint from destroyed. Then we want to protect the person from dying. So you have a little bit more time. So you would do the joint aspirate first, not you as the intern. You would say I'd get the appropriate person to do it. Um, and they would do a joint aspirate. It's quite a tricky procedure. So if you look about it, read about it in the books, it's always says like things like um, sterile environment. People can't even talk when they're doing it because you have to be really careful with a joint aspirate. One of the risks of the joint aspirate is you're introducing a foreign object into an, into the knee. So you can actually cause, like you can actually push the staph aureus on that skin back into the septic arthritic joint. Does that make sense? So it's actually quite a hard procedure to do. So we wouldn't be doing it at our level. Yes, but just remember that. So if it comes up in your EMQs, it's after the joint aspirate. It comes up in your OSCE, you say it after the joint aspirate. Okay. Principle for any acutely monoarthritic joint, even if it seems like gout, you need to aspirate it because septic arthritis has such a huge morbidity associated with it. So if you have an acutely monoarthritic red joint in your OSCE, even if all the risk factors are gout, still say you'd aspirate it. So in terms of septic arthritis, these are sort of your things, like a lumbar puncture that you look at certain things. These are the sort of measures that you're looking at. So you're looking at the colour, so it's septic, so it's going to be quite turbid, just like in a bacterial meningitis, that's what we'd call it. It's inflammation, it's sepsis in that joint, so you're going to have a lot of white blood cells. Um, I would just sort of remember that you don't need to know the specific number, just know that it's huge and that it's greater than 70% neutrophils. And obviously, in terms of your culture from that joint aspirate, it's going to be positive. I put crystals in here so for when we talk about gout, but it's not really relevant in septic arthritis. So in an OSCE, they could give you a his four minute history in which you derive septic arthritis. Then they could ask you management, which might be two minutes, and then they could give you this joint aspirate and then ask you your final diagnosis. So third year is a lot of mission mash between like all these different things. It's not so much management, that's more fourth year, but they can be a little bit. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so osteomyelitis, but we won't go into it too much because it's not really something that comes up that often. In real life, it's really hard often to differentiate between osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. Again, present quite similarly, but the differentiation in terms of what they actually are. So osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone and the bone marrow, whereas septic arthritis is inflammation of the synovial joint. Does that sort of make sense? Um, but in terms of how you differentiate it, it can be quite hard. So usually septic arthritis, you look at the joint and because it's an acute onset, they usually be limping, they can't wait bare. Osteomyelitis can still be quite acute, but sometimes it's a subacute presentation. So a few days of not being able to do those things, they might have some ability to wait bare. And usually the redness is not centered around the joint itself, but it'll be uh, like along the bone rather than the joint. In children, which you don't really need to know this yet, but in children, it's usually secondary to sepsis or secondary to bacteria in the blood. So they have bacteria in the blood and because their bones are growing, it's a very vascular area, especially this junction here. So in children, the bacteria seeds in this metaphysis area. In adults, it's more likely to due to an open wound. So they've suffered some sort of trauma in the EMQ and now they're presenting with these symptoms and usually affects the epiphysis. Um, if adults have osteomyelitis secondary to bacteria, it usually affects the bacterial bodies. And just remember for your path exam, especially anyone who has sickle cell disease, usually the pathogen is salmonella. Okay, so now we'll move on to crystal arthritis. Um, crystal arthritis will be a great one to get into your OSCE because as soon as you say gout, automatically in your mind, your differential is pseudo gout. So if they ask you those top three, you know, your top three differentials, you already got two of them. Essentially, gout and pseudo gout, you really just need to know these three things in terms of differentiating it. And the way that we were taught was calcium pyrophosphate has a P, so pseudo gout, and it's positive, so it's pseudo gout. Um, I had, I remember last year I was like looking at what the hell birefringence even is, but I wouldn't like recommend it. It's like complex. So don't remember that. Just remember positive pseudogout, negative gout. And that's how you remember it. And um, if you're confused between needle and rhomboid, you can sort of remember N is negative and N for needle. But usually they give you all three, like they'll give you these two. So they'll say um, it's weakly negative and it's needle shaped or it's rhomboid and it's positive shaped. So usually they give you both of those because that's what you'd actually get back from a joint aspirate. Okay, so keeping that in mind, what do you guys think the differential here is? Yeah. Yeah, obviously it's gout. Does anyone know why this guy is wearing flip flops apart from being probably a Bogan Australian? Yeah, so gout is really, really tender. 
So it's exquisitely tender. These people can't even wear socks. They can't let the bed sheets touch them. So they're not going to come in wearing like high heel shoes if they're a female or like runners if they're male. They're coming wearing flip flops. And I don't know, like maybe if this was an examination of Oski, they'll put that in. But if you can say it, I mean, you look really good to the examiner if you say something like that. Usually if it's an EMQ, they'll give you the buzzwords. So they'll have a complex medical history where they have really essentially cardiovascular risk factors. They're on an inappropriate diuretic and there should be hypercholesteremia. So they have, um, and they're usually quite obese as well. So usually in EMQ, the differential is quite easy to pick. Um, so how do you differentiate yourself in OSCE? Everyone's going to say gout. The way you differentiate yourself in OSCE is you say, okay, let me go through the risk factors for this patient. Why is this patient developing diabetes? So you go through, so say this wasn't given to you, you'd go through their cardiovascular risk factors. You think about, okay, do they have alcohol? Do they have seafood? Things like that. And then you think about, okay, is their kidneys cooked? Is that why they can't excrete uric acid? Um, and then when you pick those things up, you can incorporate that in your management. So can you see how that would sort of just make your sort of uh, history and management just that bit more complex? So what is gout? So it's an inflammatory arthritis and it's acute presentation. So essentially it's when these urate crystals um, accumulate in the joints. So uric acid, if you guys remember from back in first year, it's essentially a byproduct of purine breakdown, which is a part of our DNA back, back, eh, back, backbone. There we go. Um, it's metabolized by your kidneys. So essentially a lot of these patients would have coexisting um, renal disease. So I feel so it's actually quite interesting that only 10% of gout is usually attributable to lifestyle factors. So only 10% of patients present with gout. The majority the main problem is because they're having lifestyle factors like eating too much meat or seafood. 90% of them is because they have some coexisting renal failure. So just keep that in mind when you're structuring your management. So what, if someone has renal failure, what are you going to order? Yeah, absolutely. So you order UECs, but you don't order them. So in third year, I remember I would often go, I just order ESR, CRP, UECs, LGs, blah, blah, blah. And you say it off as a list. But the good student will be like, given that renal, uh, you know, the kidneys excrete uric acid, I'd like to know about the kidney functions. So I order UECs. So I recommend just sort of justifying your tests because even though both students, student A and B, said UECs, one person justified it and they sort of look like they know how it's related to the condition. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Does anyone know why leukemias and myeloproliferative disorders are associated with gout? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So leukemias and myeloproliferative disorders, you're getting a huge expansion of the amount of cells in your body. And those cells obviously will ultimately be broken down, releasing that purine. So unlikely, highly unlikely that that would ever be something that is secondary to an OSCE, but you can always just chuck it in and ask them any weight loss, any fatigue, any fever, anyone in the family diagnosed with leukemia. And that's it. That's all you have to sort of say. So in terms of managing it, remember that people with who have gout are in pain. So you cannot get full marks in your management unless you talk about controlling their pain relief. All of the other stuff about um, managing their risk factors, that's all really good. But if someone comes to you in pain and you send them home in pain, then you're like it doesn't look good. So in real life, if someone comes to the GP clinic, they've got acute pain in their first in their big toe. It's a clinical diagnosis. But we often say that we'll refer these patients for joint aspirates. Why are we doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So rule out septic arthritis, I would say that in my OSCE. Also, I want to confirm that it's gout, because if it's pseudo gout, you don't need to do as much of the chronic management, whereas in gout, you do need to do it. So these are some of the investigations. Bear in mind that serum uric acid can be normal in acute flare of gout, but you'd always want to do your CRP, which is your acute inflammatory marker, you want to do their USCs because, again, we talked about the renal excretion and these BSLs and lipid profile is um, about their coexisting morbid, like cardiovascular disease. X-ray and acute gout is not often done because you won't see that many changes necessarily, but you can always just chuck it in there This it's like their third presentation. You want to see their chronic gout. Okay, pain relief. Major, major thing is don't stop the allopurinol. So if someone's got on allopurinol and they've developed gout, if you stop it, their serum urate is just going to increase. So there's no point of doing that. So this is often an EMQ. Which of these would you do? And it's not stop the allopurinol. Endomethacin is the NSAID of choice. So usually that's the answer. And then you give, if that fails to work, so you can think about steroid injections. 
be really careful if they have diabetes i don't they don't want you to pick prednisolone because obviously that will affect their sugar control um so try and stick with indomethacin if for some reason they can't have indomethacin like um their pectic ulcer disease or things like that that's when you go to coltacine so coltacine was really it was a, the major drug back in the days and they used to titrate it till you got diarrhea so unless you got diarrhea you went on the effective dose so don't put anyone on coltacine because they will hate you yeah there we go all right so this is your differentiating between septic arthritis and gout quite easy in terms of clinical presentations as well but um so it's not it's not like a bacterial problem so it's not going to have that sort of turbid look to it it's going to be quite milky is what they describe it about or also yellow there might be some white blood cells because it's an inflammation process so you might have some white blood cells migrating but it won't be the same number they're not going to give you someone who has 49,000 white blood cells and ask you to differentiate it between it. it'll be quite obvious and again it won't be 65 percent it'll be like 20 percent in terms of culture they're not septic there's no bacteria so it's going to be negative and then you do your crystals for gout and it's going to be negatively birefringent all right what about this one Anyone want to shout something out? Yeah, easy. So what's the OSCE tip here? Osteoarthritis is one of those conditions that's unfortunately quite chronic and as much as we manage it, um, it will deteriorate. So make sure that if you ask to explain this to a patient, you get that across to them. So any condition that is sort of progressive, involves pain, you must ask about quality of life and incorporate that into your management plan. So everyone knows about osteoarthritis. You have cartilage between your joints, and over time, the majority of us in this room will probably, I feel like I have OA sometimes. Like, we're going to get OA at some point in our life. But in EMQs, it's probably the person who's older than 50, like the elderly person. There's not that many risk factors that are actually modifiable. They're generally just related to weight, which is a big one, and you're um, older. But some of the ones um, is if they have a trauma to the event, if they had a prosthesis in, they can get OA after that. Um, or overuse injuries when they're younger, if they played a lot of sports and things like that. And then congenital abnormalities. So if they have congenital abnormalities in the difference of how their legs are actually shaped, that can predispose them to OA. So the important thing about OAs, as I said, you really want to know, they might come with knee pain and you want to ask about the hip pain, about the first carpometacarpal joint, the DIP. The main one to remember here is that rheumatoid arthritis is DIP sparing. So it's not going to affect DIP joints, your distal interphalangeal joints. So if it does, it can't be um, RA. And then they can also get shoulder point problems and problems in the lower back as well. So just ask. Okay, hand exam. So hand exam, it's really hard for Monash to give everyone, to be able to like facilitate everyone to get an OA. So they probably, so you just need to know these things and say, I'm looking for this, but the patient probably won't have them. So what you're looking for is you'll ask them to do some movements towards the end of your hand exam. So they'll have restrictive range. They might have some crepitus. They can have joint line tenderness. They shouldn't have any signs of synovitis. So it shouldn't be like that acutely hot, tender erythemous joint because it's a mechanical problem, not inflammation problem. They can also get squaring of the thumb, which is deterioration in that first carpometacarpal joint. Get these osteophyte nodes and muscular atrophy. So does anyone know the names of the nodes? Yeah, which one's distal and which one's proximal? Yeah, perfect. So I just remembered BP and uh, HD, if that helps you at all. So this is just the squaring of the thumb. So it's essentially osteoarthritis of the first carpometacarpal joint and can, can be quite debilitating because if you think about your thumb, that's actually what allows us to a lot, do a lot of the fine movements of our hands. So patients who have that can begin quite a lot of um, pain and difficulty with their functions. Okay, so everyone knows about loss. So as I said before, it's really hard for them to get a, a patient who has oyster arthritis because it's hard to standardize that. Some patients might have fluid, like florid OA and someone might not have that many signs. So generally the structure is they'll get you to do a hand exam on a normal patient, then they'll give you an X-ray and you can describe the X-ray and then give the diagnosis or your differential diagnosis. So, so these are the things that you classically see these ones are generally more late signs. So when your cartilage breaks down, your bone rubs on bone, then you can get bone formation, which will cause these two things um, and the osteophytes. But one and two are the sort of the early signs you see. 
So if we have a look, you have your normal shaped joints here, and then you have your osteoarthritis um, based joints here. So the first thing to say is you have joint space narrowing. Is it equal on both sides or is it more, is one side more affected than the other? Yeah, so asymmetric joint space narrowing because it's a mechanical problem rather than like an immune problem that would affect both sides equally. Then you can get these developments of these osteophytes. So it's, so it's hard to sometimes tell, but they're generally just alpha growths along here. Um, and then you get this subchondral sclerosis, so the development of new bone because of cartilage rubs on cartilage. One of the um, things that the bone tries to do is develop new bone. And then one of the late signs is that cystic formation in the bone. So if you get an X-ray, I wouldn't say I can see one, two, three, four if they're not present because then they know that you're just re reiterating from a list. But usually they'll have at least osteophytic formation and joint space narrowing. So you'd say, I'm given the clinical history and exam I did, I'm expecting OA. I can see osteophytes and joint space narrowing. I can't see subchondral sclerosis or cyst, which might be expected. So that way you've told the examiner that you know what you're talking about, but you haven't just blurted it out as a list, if that makes sense. Okay, so if you guys get a management of OA, this is like so easy to get marks. So the way I used to think about it was sort of biological. So what can we do as medical, psychological, empowering the patient and social. So to sort of maximizing the social approach. Always consider the need, especially in OA, um, and actually in all of these conditions, for other members of the healthcare team. So, you know, your physiotherapist and your exercise physiologist. Always talk about educating the patient and telling them what's gonna happen in terms of their prognosis of the disease and always address their pain and address their quality of life. So this is just something I thought of in terms of summarizing this. Just a thing that I add here that's not here. I wouldn't necessarily, like I would say that um, employ a physiotherapist and exercise physiologist, for example, but just make sure that you say what they're gonna do. So an employ a physiotherapist to maximize this person's functioning is better than just saying, I'd like to employ a physiotherapist. So, cause that way they know that you know what these allied health mem members of the team do and what they'll help this patient specifically for. In terms of the medical side of it, so a lot of it is going to be a lifestyle. So like our osteoporosis one, uh, you might get an OA one that's similar. So I would talk, I would spend more time talking about the exercise than a little bit talking about medical and very, at the very end talking about surgical options. So essentially you really want to get them their lower limb strengthened. So if it's a lower limb problem, so if they have a knee problem, oftentimes they get quadriceps atrophy because they're not using that knee. So you want to try and get them, so you say I'd send them off to an exercise physiologist, for example, to try and strengthen their lower limbs. Apparently Tai Chi can help. I'm not actually sure why, but you can send them off to a Tai Chi class. Um, and OA of the hand, as I said, it's quite debilitating. So you want to be able to send them off to someone who can work to try and maximize their function so they get their function back. Weight loss, they'll always be obese or at least overweight in your OSCE. Um, remember that the SIM patients don't always correspond to what they say in the STEM. So a SIM patient might be quite skinny, which is um, easier for you to do an examination on. But if the STEM says that they're obese, then just keep that in mind. Um, medical wise, so you can use topical NSAIDs, so you know, the ads for Voltar and gel, gel and things like that. Um, ETG even says you can use capsicum. You can use paracetamols and NSAIDs, just be careful that they don't have contraindications for NSAIDs. Again, this is a way to sort of step up your OSCE. So if you talk about the contraindications for NSAIDs, like have you, have you ever had peptic ulcer disease, et cetera, the examiner knows that you're thinking ahead for the management. Um, and then you can also do intraarticular inject injections, but that's more of a last line medical therapy. Surgical wise, you can replace the joint. Usually they have to be of a certain age because the joint only lasts for 10 to 15 years. So you wouldn't necessarily do it in a 40 year old. Um, Osteotomy is not done that much, but it's more useful in the pa younger patients. Essentially they take out like a wedge of the bone because in OA essentially some one part is might be a bit more affected than the other so they try to straighten that joint by literally removing a wedge of a bone so it's useful in the younger patient where you don't want to necessarily replace the whole joint um, yet but you want to sort of improve their function and this um, is when you fuse a joint so you lose function when you fuse a joint but you remove pain so it's more of a late stage thing. I haven't included like arthroscopy in here because there's a lot of controversy around whether, whether it actually works or not. Majority of the medical, um, like most people think it doesn't work. So I wouldn't really say it in my OSCE. You can say it as an option to the patient, but say there's not much evidence to support it. All right, 33 year old female, one month history of stiff and painful joints, comorbidly has type one diabetes.
Anyone have any ideas? So we've covered OA, what's the other major type of arthritis? Yeah, perfect. So RA is your cardinal autoimmune disease. So this is one of the ones where I recommend learning it quite well because um, it could technically come up in an OSCE as a full station. Usually, like they not won't, RA could be their first autoimmune condition, but I think that in an OSCE situation, it'd be good to ask if they've ever had any other OA, um, any other autoimmune conditions. So things like thyroid or diabetes or your celiac diseases. Okay, so rheumatoid arthritis. So here we go. This is how I would present to an examiner. So you say it's a chronic, symmetric, inflammatory, polyarticular, depends, some rheumatoid might not be, erosive, so you're actually eroding at that joint, arthritis. Usually it affects your peripheral joints. So it's going to affect your wrists, your MCPs, and your, uh, your feet joints, but it doesn't affect your DIPs. It doesn't affect your thoracolumbar, um, and it doesn't affect your carpometacarpal, which is that joint at the face for the first um, bit of the thumb. The important thing to remember about rheumatoid is it, we learned about rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatoid actually is a systemic condition. So these patients do have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. I think it's about a two to three times risk because you're sort of inflaming a lot of the linings around your body. So just keep that in mind in terms of um, your approach to rheumatoid. I don't think you necessarily need to know about the pathophysiology. It might be helpful in your path exams to just sort of have an understanding of how rheumatoid works and it sort of helps to understand what some of the clinical presentation is as well but essentially the thought process behind it is that with your synovitis you form like a granulation tissue because of all of that inflammation that's ongoing for quite a significant amount of time and the granulation tissue can actually consist of these myofibroblasts which have contractile function essentially that means they can contract and they can cause a joint to fuse and that can also cause a joint to sort of drag in different directions which is why you get that ulnar deviation um, over time you destroy cartilage and the joints can you can destroy this entire area so that these two sort of fuse together okay so unlike oa they're going to have present with your inflammatory symptoms so they'll have that morning stiffness a few hours it's quite bad usually it's like about over an hour to lose the stiffness if it goes on for a while, they can get functional impairment. A good one to drop in your OSCEs is can you still open jars? If they can't, you're going to have to think about how you're prescribing tablets because um, you can get different rheumatoid-based like tablets that um, are easier to open. And only constitutional symptoms, remembering that rheumatoid is a systemic disease. In terms of your science, so this is science galore, so it's a good one to sort of remember for your hand exam. Um, rheumatoid nodules... Now, a good thing to remember about rheumatoid nodules is that they occur in rheumatoid factor positive disease only. So you can have rheumatoid in which you don't have rheumatoid factor positive. That's about 20% of the population. But you won't have rheumatoid nodules. Rheumatoid nodules only happen if your rheumatoid factor is positive. So just bear that in mind. Um, as it says, they're systemic disease, so they can be quite cachexic. But in terms of the actual joint, so did you guys all learn about the grape sort of method of palpating a joint? Yeah, so you want to do that. And what you're looking for there is you're feeling for that bogginess that can occur with inflammatory conditions. So just make sure you do that across every single joint. People have different ways of doing it, whether they go up, down, or across. I reckon I personally did across because it makes sense to me type of joint, but it probably wouldn't matter that much. Um, they could get joint line tenderness, and then you have your classic sort of buzzwords for rheumatoid arthritis. So just remember, so this is a swan neck deformity. If you actually have a look at a few swans, it makes sense. That's how the necks are. Um, but if you can see here, the PIP joint is quite hyperextended and your DIP joint is flexed. And butineers, on the other hand, is the opposite. So butineers is when you have the flexion of your PIP joint and extension um, of your DIP joint. So just keep that in mind. And then you can also get hyperextension of your interphalangeal joint of your thumb. So here. Um, and you get fixed flexion and you can get sublocation as well. Um, and that sort of results in that sort of Z line deformity of the thumb. So this is a quite a patient with quite chronic rheumatoid arthritis, but this is what you might see if you're at a tertiary hospital, for example. Um, so you can see those sort of signs. You can't really see the thumb that well here, but you can see sort of the swan neck sign there. It's probably a bit of booting ears. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, does anyone have, want to have a go at sort of describing this picture? <coughs> so 
So what can you see? What are the, what's, okay. First of all, do you think the muscles in between? Yeah, that's a good one to point out. What are these things? Yeah, perfect. Where else do you commonly find rheumatoid nodules? Yeah. So remember the hand exam, even if it says do a hand exam, don't forget your other things. So start off with a general appearance and do your elbows as well. So these are rheumatoid nodules. Say you had a rheumatoid nodule here. Does that mean that you don't have RA even if you have all of the other signs? Because it's a three. Yeah, so when I said DIP sparing, what it means is that that joint is spared. So you won't have any joint signs there, but you can still have skin signs there, if that makes sense. So that DIP joint won't be involved in the rheumatoid process instead of, in terms of having inflammation. But the skin, the skin signs in terms of the soft rheumatoid nodules aren't like that specific, so they can be over DIP. Okay, what about these fingers? Are they normal? Like the way they're... Are they normal? Yeah. Yeah, and what about where they're pointing? On the deviation. So... Yes, it's all the deviation of your second to fifth um, joint. So you're usually your first joint isn't affected, so your thumb won't be affected. But I think you're right. You can also get radial stress here. So you can do the piano. I think it's called the piano tapping sign, where you like press on it and can feel stress line tenderness. But I'll have a look at that. And make sure that I'm saying the right thing, and put that up later. So investigations wise, so as I said, rheumatoid is an inflammatory process. So this is when you don't just look at joint specific investigations, you look at this person as a whole. So you wanna do some blood tests for them. So start off with your basic FBE. They're gonna have normal acidic hypochromic anemia because rheumatoid is a chronic condition. So they often get anemia of chronic disease because of chronic inflammation. Rheumatoid factor, so just remember that in a STEM, if someone has very classic rheumatoid signs, but then they say their rheumatoid factor is negative, it doesn't mean they don't have rheumatoid arthritis because in 20% of pop the population who have rheumatoid, um, it's zero negative. Just something that one of my tutors taught me last year, which is probably not going to come up, but just an interesting fact, is that a patient with hepatitis C often can have elevated rheumatoid factor. And that's because um, the immune system, apparently, when you have hepatitis C, can start this generation of polyclonal antibodies. And rheumatoid factor is an antibody against an antibody. Um, and it's apparently one of the antibodies that can be produced. So just bear that in mind. It doesn't give them that diagnosis of RA. But if you only have one test to do, and it's EMQVA, which is the best test you do, the answer is anti-CCP. So this is the best test when it comes to arthritis. Okay, now ESI and CRP, does anyone know the difference between ESI and CRP? ESI yeah, but in terms of clinical UIs, it kind of says here. It's more chronic inflammation. Yeah. So Bear that in mind. I know I was often in the sort of habit of saying ESR, CRP, but they are actually different things and they test different um, things in rheumatoid. So rheumatoid is a chronic inflammatory disease. So it's not necessarily the when. So it's a real sort of like a relapsing remaining disease. So they can have these acute bouts of synovitis and then it can be a bit better in between. So when they see you, they might not necessarily be acutely inflamed at that point. So a really good thing to order in a um, OSCE situation would be like, I want to look at, I want to order ES, ESR because it's a chronic inflammation process and look at their CRP because it shouldn't be as inflamed. And so if someone has a high ESR but a low CRP, that's a really good sign that they have rheumatoid. So still say that you'd order in OSCE but just sort of give that justification. Okay, so again, it could come up in OSCE in which they give you the x-ray. Quite similar acronym to OA. So just remember O. I just remember O for loss for OA. Um, this is less. So you have a loss. You can see here, you're sort of lost your joint space. It's pretty much almost fused in some of the cases. But it's quite symmetric. So you can see both sides are affected. Whereas in OA, one side will be affected more than the other. So you can say a loss of joint space that is quite uniform. And you can see these erosions as well. So this is quite, you know, you wouldn't see this in the first attack of rheumatoid. This is talking about chronic rheumatoid. Um, and then you can also get changes to your um, 
bones around it so you can get periarticular osteopenia, which is something that's hard to pick up on um, an x-ray. And then it's hard to say, but you can argue that um, you can get soft tissue swelling around. So it looks a little bit swollen around here. So management of RA, I don't know how much depth you need to go into it. Probably not a lot. You just need to remember that methotrexate is the key drug that we use in managing RA. Just remember that methotrexate is tetrodon teratodronic. So if someone is a woman of reproductive age in your OSCE, just ask about that. Um, generally, we wouldn't give methotrexate. Um, and remember that methotrexate is used in a lot of cancer drugs and inhibits your folic acid. So you need to give the woman, the patient back folic acid. Um, I can't remember the exact regime, but you generally give folic acid I think, three times a week and you don't give it on the day that you give methotrexate because that wouldn't make sense. So you give them methotrexate um, and folic acid and then add on. So your steroids are sort of like a top-up therapy if they get acute flares. So it's good to sort of have in your back of mind some side effects because they could ask you to sort of counsel an RA patient about the management and it's sort of good to be able to drop in these buzzwords when you're talking to a patient about RA. So just remember that it's a cancer drug, so it's going to have a lot of side effects. So it affects your blood. So you want to do an FBE before they st before you start and regularly monitor that. It affects your liver, so make sure you do LFTs. It affects your mouth ulcers. Uh, it can cause mouth ulcers, so give them folic acid for that. Um, prednisolone, you want to give for flares. Remember, any steroid drug, drug you have to be really careful, so start slow um, and drop it slowly as well. And then it's actually an interesting fact that methotrexate is not just about those joints. It actually reduces inflammation as a whole. So they have found studies that patients on methotrexate do better in terms of their cardiovascular function, which is the main cause of death in RA, compared to patients who are not on methotrexate. So the other DMARDs that you guys have probably heard of is plaquenil and sulfazoline, which is also used in IBD. So these are the things you sort of go to if someone is pregnant or a woman of a reproductive age. Just remember the buzzword for plaquenil is eye toxicity. So they have to have annual eye checks. This one is very commonly used um, in IBD. It's an immunosuppressive, but it's not that bad like compared to steroids. Um, and the side effects are pretty common to many of the drugs that we be prescribing patient. Again, if this is an OSCE, I'd always put in a line about functional impact. So ask it in your history that you can put into your management. Just um, a good one is always occupational therapy because sometimes the chronic destruction of the joints means things like turning on a shower tap or opening the medication jar can be quite difficult. Okay, this is a really, really rare condition. It doesn't really happen anymore because it's usually associated with chronic RA and we get on RA really, really top. But Monash loves buzzwords of three. So just remember it. So it's rheumatoid arthritis, splenomegaly and neutropenia. Um, and they can also have skin hyperpigmentation ulceration. Don't, um, but that's not part of the triad. So usually it's something, it'll be like a history, like a 70-year-old woman with a 20-year history of uncontrolled RA presenting with recurrent infections or something like that. Then that's when you think in your mind, Felty syndrome. I don't think you'd ever see it in real life anymore, but you might see it in your pathology papers. All right, SLE. So the reason I didn't put a case sort of stem for this, I think is SLE is really hard to test an OSCE because it's a bunch of non-specific signs that often don't occur at once. It's good differential to put into your OSCE, but I don't necessarily think it might be the entire stem. It could be, but I'm less likely compared to the other ones. So SLE is your classic autoimmune condition. It affects women more than men. It affects Asian people more than Caucasian people. And if we're in America, it affects African-American people um, as well. So again, SLE is one of those conditions that can be really bad at times and then can be better, and etc. So just a point on SLE, it can actually be drug induced. Now there's over 50 different drugs. So I'm not, no, no one's gonna expect you to remember those drugs. All you need to remember is this buzzword, buzzword of antihistone antibodies. So if you suspect someone's recently commenced on a new drug, they develop signs of SLE, order this or say you'd order this antihistone antibodies or look for this in your path exam because in 100% of cases, or that's at least what my tutor um, taught me last year, it's going to be positive if they've got drug-induced SLE. So that's a really good way of sort of differentiating SLE that's drug-induced versus organic SLE. I don't really think you guys need to know the pathophys that much. Essentially, it's a complex autoimmune condition. It has cytotoxic features and also has immune complex features. So immune complexes have charges which can cause that inflammation around there. But um, you just really need to know it's common autoimmune condition. All right, so there's a number of diagnosis like criteria. 
So you guys will probably remember from your lectures that you need to have four in total. One has to be clinical and one has to be immunological. Um, and does anyone know what the exception to that rule is? Yeah, so I heard some whisperings of lupus nephritis. So lupus nephritis, if someone presents that as their first sign and you go in and do a renal biopsy and can confirm they have lupus nephritis, don't need any of the other criteria. You can look for the other criteria, to, but you've already got your diagnosis of SLE. Um, this is just a good picture I took from Nature's Review, which is sort of just a way of sort of remembering them. But we can go through them now. So what's this? Yeah, awesome. So this is a male rush. It, it, your differential could be rosacea, but you can see here you are sparing of the nasolabial folds, which is classic of this butterfly-shaped rash. What's this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is your photosensitive rash. This is a patient's back. So you might expect they've been walking out in the sun, and this is sort of the rash that they come out with in terms of being exposed to that sun. This is your discoid rash. So you can see the irregular-shaped um, rash with a central clearing and an advancing edge. So that's your discoid rash. So there's your skin. Your hair and mouth, does anyone know what these are? Yeah, so you get alopecia, which is a hair. There's a specific type, but I can't remember it off the top of my head, um, of the hair ball, like the, the type of alopecia. And you can also get mouth ulcers, and this is obviously quite a bad one. And then your others. So your other ones are your non-skin, um, like your non-obvious on the patient's appearance, so occurring internally. So they can get synovitis. So usually they might get synovitis of joints, but they can also get those sort of similar so like to synovitis, but sericitis. So you get your pleurisy, your pericarditis, endocarditis. I think this came up in our like one of our path quizzes. So um, Lumen Sachs endocarditis. So it presents like endocarditis, but it's a sterile deposit. It's not a bacterial inf inf uh, infection. It's a sterile problem. Um, and that usually affects your mitral valve. And then you can get your renal involvement, which is what we're talking about, and that's a feared complication. So lupus nephritis. And you can also get your neurological involvement. So your psychosis symptom unlikely come up. And then your bloods, you can get pan essentially pancytopenia. So in terms of immunological criteria, so as I was saying before, remember one antibody at a time. So anti-double-stranded DNA is the one that's associated with SLE. You will get an elevated ANA. But every time a question asks you which antibody do you pick, ANA is technically right. It will be high, but it was high in many, many conditions. And it's high in a lot of people who don't have autoimmune conditions. So it's not a great test to have. So um, it's either going to be elevated anti-DS DNA, which is double-stranded, or anti-Smith. You can also get complement. So complement sort of varies with your disease activity. So if they're having acute flare, they'll have high complement. So it's a good one to sort of say um, that you do. You can get direct Coombs test, which is your hemolytic anemia, and antiphospholipid antibodies, which is a complication of SLE, um, and which can cause recurrent. So if someone's presenting with recurrent DVTs, recurrent arterial thrombosis or miscarriage, think about a um, antiphospholipid syndrome. This is an acronym I found online. If this helps you to sort of remember all the different criteria. So you have SOAP, Brain, MD. So this is, um, just remember that you need to have at least one positive blood test and then one other, so like an oral ulcer, sericitis. So you can't have all four positive blood tests or all four um, clinical criteria to diagnose it. So a note on SLE arthritis. So this is what we call Jacquard's arthropathy. Um, what it is, is actually quite an interesting condition. It's a non-erosive condition, so you're not actually affecting the joint, you're not eroding to the joint, and it's actually a reversible condition that you can sort of fix as the disease process goes on. What is characteristic of this is that ulnar deviation. So if this comes up to you in your OSCE, be careful not to jump straight to RA if you see something like this, because you can see the joint spaces are quite nice. Um, there's not really any narrowing, you can't see any erosions, not really swollen around there. So just make sure you look at your history and think about whether or not um, it fits with an RA picture. In saying that, Jacquard's arthropathy is one of the SLE arthritis, but other arthritis associated, they can have OA, RA, chronic gout, and psoriasis. So they can all occur with SLE as well. So this is something I took off one of the room lectures that we have. <sighs> Essentially, I just wanted you guys to be aware that Plaquenil is your drug of choice. So if you guys remember, that's one of the drugs we use in RA when you're looking at a woman of reproductive age. So if you have an EMQ, the answer is Plaquenil. 
Um, and then you have your specific ones, which you are less likely to be tested on in terms of how they are manifesting. In terms of other things, remember SLE is a systemic problem. So fix the other things. So fix their CVD risk um, is a big one. And they also, um, I think, at higher risk of osteoporosis. So just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, scleroderma. Again, unlikely to come up in the OSCE, but a differential that you could put in. So this is an autoimmune problem. So all of these are autoimmune problems. And essentially we have those um, activation of those fibroblasts that I was talking about before, and you get fibrosis. So this is a way of remembering scleroderma. These localized one is essentially cutaneous features. So they'll have a linear cutaneous problem or like a circular problem, not gonna come up. This is what comes up. So generalized is also known as systemic sclerosis. So scleroderma is also known as systemic sclerosis. So don't get confused. And then it can be limited or diffuse. Crest syndrome is something that all of us have been taught. It's less, we don't really, the term Crest syndrome is not really used that much anymore because it doesn't sort of cover the, like the whole presentation of how it can present, but it's a really good one to sort of learn because then you remember the things that happen. So Crest syndrome, what is it? So you get calcinosis and also this is the antibody. So CC, so anti-centimere antibody, can get quite bad Raynaud's phenomenon. So last year I saw a patient who had such bad Raynaud's that they were amputating his fingers. So just keep that in the back of his mind, unlikely to ever be the EMQ. You can get dysphagia. So dysphagia is another common OSCE topic. It's never ever, in, if you get a dysphagia OSCE, it's almost 100% likely to be gourd or cancer. But if you chuck in a few scleroderma questions, the examiner is impressed. So just put that in. They can get sclerodactyly, which is that sausage shaped fingers and that telling to change as well. So if you guys are interested, the actual differentiation between limited and diffuse scleroderma is about your skin involvement. So I got this off Dermnet, which is a really good resource if you have dermatological um, problems. So limited refers to the fact that you affect your distal limbs, not your proximal. So as soon as you get past your elbows and your knees, you're getting into diffuse scleroderma. So you can see sort of the sclerodactyly, so the sausage shaped fingers there, the raynards. Okay. Something that a lot of people forget, so they think of limited scleroderma as only affecting skin or they remember the skin complications. Remember we, that scleroderma does affect your internal organs. So we talked about the esophagus, but the major one that we're worried about is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which can occur, and primary biliary cirrhosis. So which I think Manini talked to you, or one of the lectures in the morning talked to you about that. So in terms of how you would monitor these patients, make sure you get an annual echocardiogram and you also do um, lung function tests as well. And in terms of PBAC, you screen them with anti-mitochondrial antibodies, which is the buzzword. So it's PBC, not PSC. If they want you to pick PSC, it's going to be someone with an ulcerative colitis background. So just keep that in mind because they can be quite confusing. Okay, so diffuse scleroderma, we worry about it a little more because as the name suggests, it affects more things. The problem with diffuse scleroderma as well is it can be quite rapidly progressive. So they can start off with some skin involvement and then affect all of the internal organs. So something you have to get on top of it. It commonly affects the face. So this is your facial appearance, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. So you get tissue atrophy of your lower eyelid. You can get this mouth firing appearance and you can get what looks like matted telling tissue. So it's like a matted appearance. Um, on the hands, it's similar. So you can get those swollen phalanges that we were talking about, but they can also get ulcerations. So just keep that in mind. This one, it's anti-70 um, anti or anti-topamarese antibody, I think it's called. So if someone presents with a picture and you're not sure if it's limited or diffuse, keep an eye out for which antibody. Because if it's limited, it's going to be centromere. And if it's diffuse, it's going to be anti-70 or anti-topamarese um, antibody. Diffuse scleroderma comes up in the context of renal crisis as well. So kidney is one of the commonly affected organs. So anytime someone has a renal crisis with diffuse scleroderma, chuck them an ACE inhibitor. Um, the major one that we're worried about apart from the kidney is also pulmonary fibrosis. So you guys would have known the buzzword of honeycombing appearance is what you see on CT scans. So this one, you monitor them with bronchoalveolar lavages and also biopsy their lung tissue. Schrogen syndrome, did you guys learn about this? Because it wasn't in your matrix, but I think it's in your PATH paper. So PATH, path is really like, so room is low yield on the uh, EMQ, so paper one, but it's quite high yield on paper two. So this came up, I think, in the year before mine. So Schrogen syndrome is an autoimmune discussion of your exocrine glands, not your endocrine, your exocrine. 
So most commonly affects your lacrimal and your salivary glands. So a patient will present with difficulty seeing, but they won't say that. They'll say something like, um, I feel like there's dirt in my eye. And oh, by the way, I can't chew a cracker. I don't know any patient that presents with GP like that, but that's what's going to be in your EMQ. So that's just remember that. It's a type 4 hypersensitivity. So I think that was the question that was asked in the pathology paper the year before mine. What type of hypersensitivity is it? Um, and so it's a lymphocytic mediated damage. Um, so as I said, so you can like dry eyes, which in and of itself doesn't sound too bad, but if it's too dry, then it can be quite harmful. So you can get irritation to the iris. You can get dry mouth, um, which can cause caries in an older woman. And sometimes you can also affect your vaginal events as well. So they might get um, vaginal dryness. Just a point, so if someone presents with long-standing Sjogren's syndrome and then they have this random unilateral enlargement of their parotid glands, the answer is B-cell lymphoma. Because for some reason in Sjogren's syndrome, you can get an increased risk of this. So if it's long-standing and it's been there for ages and now they're randomly presented, the answer is B-cell lymphoma. Um, in terms of your antibodies, so this is your anti-Rho and anti-La antibodies, obviously your ANA. And Schreger syndrome can either be primary, which means it's only occurring in isolation of it itself, so that's it, or it can be secondary. And if it's secondary, um, usually you have RA. So again, if the OSCE is about RA, chuck in a few lines about dry eyes and dry mouth. All right, so we're almost there, guys. So seronegative spondyloarthropodes. So these are the ones that have negative rheumatoid factor. So you do a blood test and then and then negative. So these are associated with your HLA B27. May want to know about is ang spon. So this is your young male who presents with lower back pain. I actually had a friend in med school last year who got ang spon after we studied it, which was, was a bit sad. Um, so the things you need to remember about ang spon or uh, sorry seronegative spondyloarthropathies is they're associated with enthesis, which is inflammation of the tendon. So oftentimes they have this lower back pain and then they'll be like, oh yeah, my heel hurts, and then you'll be confused. But essentially, it's an association. So that's the um, so that's the information of that tendon or ligament. So anspon, as we said, it's a sacroiliac joints. Most commonly affects males. So this is one of the weird ones where all of the other room conditions affect females, and anspon is one that affects males. Ninety-five percent will be HLA B twenty-seven positive. And remember, that's not an autoantibody. That's just a gene. So it's a, a, a gene association. So I should have asked you guys what it presents like, but essentially it's lower back pain. It radiates to the knee, but never below the knee. So if someone's got pain radiating all the way down their leg, it's not anxpon. Patient wakes up in the later half of the morning, so they're fine for the first half, and then they'll, the inflammation will wake them up around 4 a.m. I think it's a buzzword. They can get alternating buttock pain, so one side, one sacroiliac joint is worse than the other. And then you can get this in, this inflammation of the tendon of the ligament. So just keep that in mind. If someone seems to have like some weird association with back pain, it's usually an expon. Okay, I can ask you guys this one. So there are six A's associated with anxpon. Does anyone remember them? So the six associations. We can we can do it as a group, guys. Mm -hmm, perfect. This one. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Any other ones? What about in the eye? Is there any in the eye? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's three. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll put you out of your misery. So six A's of angst spawn is something they could easily test. And it's again, EMQs have layers. So you might get the EMQ on the angst bond, but this will just clinch the diagnosis for you. So they might. So we've had anteroaxial subluxation. Also, another point with rheumatoid arthritis um, that they often test in the EMQs, C1, C2 dislocations. So just remember that because often rheumatoid arthritis can affect that joint. So it's something that anthes like your, you'll say something like women's being prepared for surgery. What are you worried about? And you're worried about the C1, C2 joint when you intubate them. So that's a common EMQ that's come up. So your anterior uveitis, uveitis, I don't think there's that many T's in that. Um, apical lung fibrosis, aortitis, which eventually can lead to aortic regurgitation. Amyloidosis, so that was a re weird condition that we learned about, I'm sure you guys learned about your renal path. And underlying autoimmune bowel disease. And again, it's more commonly UC compared to Crohn's. Okay, so what's this? Yeah, so if you have a young male presenting back pain, 
Do you think that this is what you'd say if you'd x-ray the back? No, because this is very like different. So you most likely see nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So x-ray in acute situation doesn't help you at all because this is a late stage untreated angst spine. So essentially this is what's called bamboo spine because it looks like a bamboo. And it, essentially it doesn't look like your normal spine where you can see the nice material bodies with the spaces in between. It looks like it's all fused together and you can sort of see that bamboo appearance. So it's got caused because of these, um, where the arrows are pointing, you have these marginal syndem, I can't even say it, but does anyone know what those things actually are? Syndesmophytes. Yeah, essentially. So it's calcifications. So syndesmophytes refer to cal calcifications, and these occur in your intervertebral ligaments that hold the sides of your vertebra together. Or they can also occur in the annulus fibrosis. But essentially, because you've got these calcifications between your ligaments, it can actually, over time, if you don't treat angstspon, lead to the vertebra fusing together. Rider syndrome. Okay, um, this one's really easy. Any young male going to Thailand coming back often has re reactive or rider syndrome. So it's post GIT, but most in your EMP post STI infection. So can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Don't tell this to your non-med friends because I did and they thought I was really, really weird and worried that this is how we learn, but this is how we learn. So um, just remember it, can't see, can't pee, can't climb. So that should be arthritis, um, can't climb a tree, really easy diagnosis, young male, comes back from an overseas trip and has at least two, of, or two out of three of these symptoms. Psoriatic arthritis, so I put it in here because it's a HLA B27 association, it's zero negative, um, but you can learn it as a condition on its own. So essentially you have your dactylitis, so your sort of shaped fingers. Does anyone know what these things are? Pitting, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so onchalitis, this is onchromosis, which is, I think, development of all this. Actually, I don't 100% know how to explain the difference between onchalitis and onchromosis, but I think it refers to the fact that you have all this tissue in between the nail bed and the finger, whereas onchalitis is more of a distortion of your growth of your nail bed. You're never going to see this. It's just a late sign to sort of imprint it into your memory. Okay, so your hand x-ray, again, another one that they can sort of throw at you. So I recommend learning your hand x-rays as well. Um, and pencil in the cup. And the way I sort of remember this was P, pencil, P for psoriatic arthritis. So towards the end of the year, just having these little tricks up your sleeve can sort of help you. Okay, who, the good student also gonna talk about psoriasis. So if you think the stem is leading towards psoriatic arthritis, then say I'll also look for the rash. So we all know about the rash, well-circumcised, sun and pink, um, what, um, uh, oily colors. Um, and does anyone know so we all know it's the back of the elbow in front of knees, so it extends the surfaces, but why does it spare the face usually? So how can, what's one of the ways that we can treat psoriasis? Yeah, we can use steroids, it's not usually a first line option. Yeah, so the first line options are always things like a skincare, so your moisturizers and stuff like that. But you can actually send these patients off to UV therapy because we know that sunlight helps psoriatic arthritis. So your face is often exposed to the sun and we don't cover our face that much. So oftentimes patients won't have any signs of psoriasis on their face. Um, whereas you can imagine back to the elbows, front of your knees could be quite easily covered. So UV therapy is actually one of the second or third line options of treating um, psoriasis. It's not that itchy, but it can be mildly itchy. So if they say it's itchy, it doesn't rule it out because it can be about, like it can be a mild itch. All right, 70-year-old female, can't hang a washing, can't rise a chair, rise from a chair. Mm -hmm. So it's polymyalgia rheumatica. Oh. What did you say? I said polymyalgia. Yeah, so we'll go through the differentiation. Um, usually the buzzword is polymyalgia rheumatica, so you get proximal muscle pain. So you get in the shoulders and your hip girdle. Really, really easy to diagnose in the EMQ. That's literally what they'll give you. They'll give you some lady who has difficulty with both things. Um, but it's hard in real life because you can imagine these are quite non-specific signs. So this is this is not a problem with the muscle itself. So if you you can do a CK to differentiate it from polymyositosis. So polymyositosis is actual problem with the skeletal muscle, um, and it's really hard in that stem to differentiate between the two. So if you thought polymyositosis, it's absolutely right because you can't really differentiate it there. But if you're differentiating in real life. 
you have a bit of inflammation, so your ESL will be elevated, but polymyalgia, it doesn't actually, there's nothing wrong with the muscle itself. So the CK, your creatinine kinase, will be normal. Okay, and then someone's presenting with a headache. So everyone should know this one. What is it? Yeah. So association with polymyalgia rheumatica. So if you get an OSCE, unlikely, but if you do, always ask for our GCA symptoms because it can be um, light, side threatening. So what is giant cell um, vasculitis? So it's a large vessel vasculitis. So vasculitis refers to inflammation of your blood vessels. You can split them off into the different sizes. So your large vessels, your medium, or your small. Small affects things like your kidneys, medium, your like muscles. Large refers to eight branches of the aorta, of which the temporal artery and ophthalmic artery, uh, of which the temporal and ophthalmic arteries are. So it's granulotosis vasculitis. So that's what you're looking for under biopsy. You're looking for the formation of granulomas. Um, and technically it can affect any branch of the carotid artery, but classically the temporal artery. So this is the patient who presents with jaw claudication, having a tender headache that's worse when you touch it on palpation, brushing their hair, eating their food. Um, and they can also present with visual changes, which suggests the ophthalmic artery is being affected. Okay, I just told you the answer, but um, there was an EMQ in one of the papers that um, I saw that was saying a patient presents with, G with very obvious GCA. So what do you do first? Do you refer them urgently to an ophthalm or do you commence them on steroids? Yeah, so of course you refer them to ophthalm, but it doesn't matter if the ophthalm person comes an hour later and the eye is gone, like what are they gonna do? So you have to start steroids. So if that is an EMQ that comes up for you, just remember that. Um, if the next step in management, steroids is a major thing. And it's not just steroids for a few days. It's actually steroids for a significant amount of time. So it's about a year, mostly two years of steroids um, because this is quite a significant condition and you have to taper them off slowly. So steroids as a drug sort of consent is actually quite a good OSCE station because there's so many side effects. So it could be someone presenting with a condition which you need to put them on long-term steroids and the OSCE station is about consenting them to start steroids. So just remember that. Okay, so as we said, um, so you want to do corticosteroids and then remember to do temporal artery biopsy, needing to look at two, leash, two areas at least. Okay, so your anchor soda vasculitis, all of these are going to be buzzwords. They're not really going to come up in the OSCE. So Wegener is your, which I think Wegener was some really, really crazy guy who did lots of bad things. So we're not using his name anymore, but um, I think it's granulomatosis with polyangitis. Um, the way I remembered it was that um, C anchor, I, I can't really, I should have put a picture here, but if you think about a human body, C covers every, C, if you draw a C over it, it's going to affect your, your nose, your lungs, and your kidneys. And that's how, in my mind, I remember that C and car is associated with Wegener's or where you have your nasopharynx involved. So can everyone picture that? Like if you draw a C across someone's body, starting from the lungs, I'm mean, starting from the nose and going down to the kidneys, you're going to affect all three. And that helps you differentiate between the other ones, which more affect your lungs and kidneys. So all you need to know are the buzzwords, C and car, um, Wegener's granulatosis and granulatosis with polyangitis. And usually is a middle-aged man presented with hematuria, hemoptysis, and blood from and a nosebleed. Microscopic polyangitis um, affects your lungs and your kidneys, doesn't affect your nose. So it won't have that. And it's Pianka. I actually saw a case of Cherry Strauss once, which is really cool. So it's a patient presenting, like a 35-year-old woman presenting with asthma. And a 35-year-old shouldn't present with the first onset of asthma. That's a childhood condition. And so they did more investigations and they found peripheral eosinophilia. And ultimately, she got a Cherry Strauss syndrome diagnosis, which is quite cool. So this buzzwords will be here. Asthma doesn't affect your kidneys as much, more lungs and hearts. You usually have eosinophilia, so they might have other allergic problems. And this is your PN cup. All right, so this is where we talk about um, skeletal muscle. So not much. There's only really two main ones that you need to know. I learned dermatomyositis first because as soon as you learn that one, you learn polymyositis. It's the same thing minus a skin condition. So these are inflammation of your skeletal muscles. So just like you inflammation in your joints, this is inflammation of your skin and your skeletal muscle depending on the condition. So in dermatomyositis, you affect, again, your proximal muscles a lot more than your distal muscles. So they won't, they won't be affecting the muscles down here. We'll be talking about shoulder pain. It's usually bilateral, shouldn't be unilateral. And the buzzword is this helotrope, which I think refers to like a purpley looking flower, rash. So this is what it'll look like. They can also get this malar rash as well, but the buzzword is this purple um, rash around the eye. So just keep that in mind. 
So anti-GO1 antibody is the association with dermatomycetosis. Um, if, if there's a question that asks you about this, they'll usually have a very high level of CK because you imagine your, your, the muscle is actually inflamed and CK is a mark of your muscle function. So that's going to be highly inflamed. And again, this is one of the ones where you treat with high dose steroids. Polymycytosis is the same thing, but they won't have the skin manifestation. So they won't have that rash, um, but they'll still have the skeletal pathology. So I haven't gone into fractures too much because a lot of fractures are buzzwordy. If it comes up in an OSCE, just really make sure that you talk about neurovascular compromise. So the major thing you're worried about in a fracture, not so much the bone problem itself, it's more about cutting off a blood supply or a nerve supply. So always, always test um, the hand. And remember that one of the signs, one of the first signs, so if you have a fracture, right, your sympathetic system is going to go crazy because you're in pain. So it should really, your hand should be sweaty. So in the EMQ, if they say the hand is not sweaty, it means that you're most likely affected your nerve supply distally. So that's a buzzword to make sure that they have neurovascular compromise and that sort of ups your urgency of treatment because um, you want to make sure that they have um, a good neurovascular supply. In terms of the EMQs, very buzzwordy. So usually um, quite commonly repeated questions from your past Apollo papers if you look through them. So I would just recommend going through the, um, the different types of fractures um, and having a look at the x-rays in association with them. But usually you can clinch it from the stem itself. Okay, the next few slides are just random things that are good for your path exam. So fibrosis, upper and lower lungs are good ones to know. So upper lung fibrosis is often um, referred to as your CARTs. So some, a lot of these ones are your occupational exposures. So you're exposed to coal work, you're coal, um, exposed to TB, you're exposed to silicosis, things like that. But don't forget angst bond. So angst bond is sort of like the red herring, like the one that's different there. It's not an occupational exposure. So angst bond um, affects upper lung fibrosis, which is what someone said, which is really good. So your apical lung. And your lower lung is more likely to do with your autoimmune. So ISO R is how I can remember. So either idiopathic, so no cause, or um, your autoimmune. And then obviously there's one exception, so that's asbestosis. So that's more likely to mediate lower lung fibrosis. Amyodiron is a good one to remember as a lower lung fibrosis. All right, so we kind of discussed this. Another one that comes up in the EMQs is talking about, oh, this guy has a really, really high ferritin. The answer is not hemochromatosis. If it's occurring after acute problem, it's because it's an acute inflammatory reaction. Um, you can say that you order these things to see as an acute inflammatory reactant, and don't forget about the ones that decrease as well. And we talked about that. All right, we'll just go through like a couple of EMQs and then head off. It must have been a long day for you guys. So Max has chronic hep C's in hospital for treatment. You're the intern talking to Max. He complains of joint stiffness and pain. Um, takes over an hour, so you're thinking inflammatory. You want to impress your consultant. What's the best blood test to order? Yeah, perfect. So we went through this. Um, it's anti-CC body. So rheumatoid factor is a good one to order as well. But if they ask you for one, it's anti-CCP antibody. Okay. This one's quite obvious. Yeah, so these are questions that are from your release papers. So you can see it's that difficult as long as you know your basic principles. Um, they just confuse you by chucking in every possible condition. So just don't get confused. Okay, so this question is from Smart Collaboration, which I'm not sure if everyone's heard about, but essentially it was a bunch of um, past students who all wrote questions and put together as a booklet. So they're a bit harder than um, like the Monash questions. So you can rule out gout, rule out rheumatoid. Oh, yeah, unlikely. Pseudogout would present similar to gout. No mention of septic signs. What about angst bond? Angst bond? Yeah. So angst bond is your classic young male, back pain, morning stiffness, inflammatory <coughs> problem. And this is what I was talking about. Don't get confused about the feet signs. That's your um, inflammation of the tendons. You can also get plantar fasciitis with angst bond, which I think, which is what this stem is referring to. So don't get confused. Okay. 80 year old woman has chronic OA, the hip. She comes to the ED, hot, swollen, painful joint, three days after GP had given her steroid injection. 
So that was just a joke. I don't know why they put hysterical pregnancy in there, but obviously staphylococcal arthritis. <laughs> um, 80 year old women is of course gonna have hysterical pregnancy, but you'll see some fun things in like psych next year. We had this patient who was adamant that she was pregnant even though she wasn't, so that was interesting. Um, staphylococcus arthritis, so her, what are her risk factors for having septic arthritis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are your two main ones. Old lady, chronic joint, yeah, old lady, chronic joint problem, also has an intraarticular steroid joint, so you've given her an immunosuppressive and you might have introduced some bacteria when you're given that, so you clinch the diagnosis. How would you treat? Perfect. If it was a young male? Perfect. Good job. Okay, this one's a bit hard. <laughs> so this is just an association that can sometimes happen together. They don't necessarily mediate each other. But the answer is bronchiectasis. So this is your classic bronchiectasis picture in terms of the really, really foul amount of sputum. So it could, in actuality, rheumatoid arthritis more likely mediates interstitial fibrosis, but it's not gonna present like that. Your interstitial fibrosis is much more insidious presentations, your pan and spiritual cackles, things like that. It's not gonna present with copious amounts of sputum. So the rheumatoid arthritis is probably like a little bit of a red herring. They can occur together, but if you're gonna remember one association, I remember interstitial fibrosis. All right. So who thinks it's C? Yeah, an E? Yeah, so this is a really hard question because obviously students wrote it, so they make it hard. So um, it seems like a very classic gout presentation, but linear calcifications on x-ray is a buzzword for pseudo gout. So it's something that you sort of just need to learn rather than understand, like it's not like it's not hard to understand that, it's just sort of something that you learn. So in that case, um, it's C. Okay, so 66-year-old women. Okay, I'm going to add something in here to make because this is hard to differentiate between the two. So you do an upper limb neurological examination and her power is 5 and 5 for all muscle groups. So what is it if, if it's so her power is fine, but she's really weak. She feels really weak. What is it? Who thinks it's um, L polymycetosis? Does anyone think it's L? Okay, and ever, does everyone think it's N? Yeah, perfect. So the way you differentiate between poly polymycetosis and polymyalgia rheumatica, if they haven't given you a CK level is about weakness. So remember, polymycytosis is an actual problem with the skeletal muscle structure. So you're destroying the skeletal muscle, so they're going to be objectively weak. With polymyalgia rheumatica, it's like an autoimmune condition. They feel really weak and fatigued. But objectively, if you do a new upper limb neurological examination, they'll have five out of five power. So that's how you sort of differentiate. It's a bit hard just based off this stem, I think, to differentiate between the two. All right, last question. So this is your jacuzzi. I should have chosen a different X-ray, but um, just remember that it looks like RA, but it's not RA. Awesome, guys. That's it. Thanks so much, Thanks, Will. Hope tomorrow as well. Yeah, I hope so. Good luck with your exams. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.